So welcome, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Would you mind if you come closer to us so we feel close to you? We feel so distant from you. So if you are in the back, please come to the first three or four rows. If it's we want to see trouble. your faces. We want to hear your voices. So please come up to the front. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, so to everybody in the room, welcome. To everybody who is watching us online from around the wor world, welcome. To the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, and to this afternoon's event, Media and Arts for Peace. My name is Darren Cambridge. I'm a senior program officer here at USIP in our Center for Applied Conflict Transformation, and I'm going to be one of your MCs for today's event. I'll be the second one uh, MCing today, and my name is Hani Al Sayed. I'm an associate fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. I'm also an independent creative consultant and producer. Uh, happy to be here with all of you. Uh, the online course, Media and Arts for Peace, and so is our hashtag, so, and, and Darren will tell you all about that, is um, it has taken two years since uh, the initial start of this course in the making between research and content and pre-production and production and post-production. So we hope that today you experience um, the, the role and the power of media and the arts. So we have a lot in store for you today. Yes. As you notice on the program, it goes from 1 to 5 p.m. So let us tell you what is in store for you. We are going to take a deep dive into how creativity, storytelling, and strategy help those of us who are working for peace leverage and channel media and the arts into some of the most powerful tools to break cycles of violence and transform conflict. And we're gonna do this deep dive in three different spaces. The first space, as you probably noticed when you walked in and registered, is our Peace Within Art exhibit. And that features works of art from people who work with and for USIP. So I saw many of you have already had an opportunity to check out those photos, those videos, those works of art. If you have not had a chance or you want some more time, we will have an intermission. So that'll be another opportunity for you to check out all that wonderful artwork. And for those of you who are watching online, um, the website uh, on which you are watching this live stream, there's information about all the exhibitors and their work that you can, can check out. So that's what's happening outside in the atrium. What's and happening on, inside? On the inside, what's going to be happening is we will have uh, our practitioners, our peace activists, our scholars, our academics, our scientists to show and tell from their own stories and experiences about the power of such creative tools as media and the art. So they will engage with you as well, whether you are online and right here in the room. So be prepared in the next five hours. And the third space where today's event is happening is, of course, online. So again, I want to extend a thank you and welcome to everyone who's watching us online. And everyone in this room, you're going to stay connected with not just everyone who's watching around the world online. You're also going to stay connected with people who right now have no idea this event is actually going on. And you're going to do that through the use of social media. After all, this is a media and arts for peace uh, event. So we are all going to experiment a little bit with our own social media platforms and channels using the hashtag media arts peace. So I want to take a quick poll so we can get a sense of how much social media folks we have in the room. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you are on Snapchat. Wow, a decent amount. OK, keep them up. Too. Keep them up. <laughs> Raise your hand if you are on Instagram. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. All right, so we've got Snapchatters, Instagrammers. Keep them up, keep them up. Raise your hand if you are on Twitter. Okay, and raise your hand, keep them up, keep them up. Raise your hand if you are on Facebook. Okay, you take a look around. Pretty much every single person in this room yeah. is part of some social media network. And so folks who are watching online, and folks in this room, anytime you hear 
see or experience something worth sharing, we want you to use that social media platform to share that okay. using the hashtag yeah. media arts piece. I also want to say to the Snapchatters out there, um, mm -hmm. we have a special right. geo filter. And if you're on Snapchat, you'll know what that is. We have a special geo filter that is functioning and operational in this building between the hours of one Hi. and five. You mind? I think Honey's gonna actually do a little bit of it right now. We're gonna do a little selfie here. Oh God, you're taller than me. I got longer, <laughs> I got longer hands. Snapchat selfie. There you go. All, All right. right. So, go for it. So while she's doing the Snapchat filter, I'm gonna do my first Instagram post. So. There we go. On the count of three. See that? Nice. Media and arts for peace. On the count of three, I want you all to, in your most, most joyful and celebratory tone, yell at us, peace, and put up the peace sign. You ready? In one, two, three. Peace! There we go. <laughs> so she put that on Snapchat. I'll put it on Instagram using yeah. the hashtag media arts peace. And again, I know some of you probably have a Twitter account and maybe have never tweeted anything in your life. Today is the day to post your first tweet. Maybe you're on Facebook just to follow your friends and family, but you never actually post anything yourself. Today is the day to make your first post on what people are sharing, resources, videos, etc. So that's what's happening online in that space. And next, what is happening is you're going to get an insight on the global campus, USIP's global campus, as well the course itself, the online course, Media and Arts for Peace. And that's going to be with our colleague, Dominic Kirali. Please help me welcome him. He is the director of USIP's global campus. All right. It is a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, this course, uh, this event is a celebration of the launch of the Median Arts for Peace course, which we co-designed and developed with the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And um, Ambassador Doucet, um, I've long admired the, the work of your institution, and, uh, which has an innovative, creative, and forward-thinking forward in its approach to peace building. And it continues to be a great pleasure to collaborate with you and your team, um, both on this course and hopefully for many more in the future as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I believe in the power of uh, the media and the arts. And you may be wondering what that is up on the stage. So I thought I would, I would do a little show and tell to prove to you and to demonstrate how Media and arts are such a powerful tool for peace building. So I'm going to take the microphone with me, and I'm going to show you what's inside the box. Still me here? OK. So inside this box is actually my toolbox from my house. I have many toolboxes, and this is one of them. So inside it's a typical toolbox. Actually, how many of you have a toolbox at your house? All right, a lot of, okay, a lot of handy men and women in the audience. So often in a toolbox, you have traditional tools to get a job done. Hammer, tape measure, screwdriver, wrench, pliers. Anybody, anybody know what this is? Wire cutter, all right, impressive. And of course, don't forget the safety goggles. Now, there's many more tools at my, in my garage for specialized jobs, but these are, these are, for the most part, are the traditional tools to get a job done. You need the right tools for the right job. Now, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite tools. This is a saw. It looks like a gun. It's not. It is a saw. So this is my reciprocating saw. Has anybody ever used one of these? Really? Carla? You oh, excellent. All right. <laughs> my boss. <laughs> this saw has incredible destructive power, as some of you know. I've taken down walls. I've taken down steel fences. I've taken down small trees. 
I've destroyed a lot of things with this saw. I did not bring the blades, but they come in varying sizes. I cannot emphasize enough how destructive this little tiny thing is. At the same time, when I do a new project around my house on renovations, this, this saw is often at my side to create and to build, to restore my house. Destructive power and also a restorative power. And the same could be said about peace building. In the traditional, I emphasize traditional tools of peace building, you have tools such as mediation, negotiation, conflict analysis, dialogue, very important and effective tools to make peace possible, USIP's mission. But like my reciprocating saw, media and arts are also powerful tools. These tools can be used to promote hate, discrimination, and destruction. At the same time, the arts and the media can advance reconciliation, justice, and peace. Tools to either dehumanize or humanize, or to restore or to destroy. So the questions that we have at, at the hand of us, at our hand are, how can we leverage theater, painting, print, dance, film, graffiti art, all sorts of expressions, tools to build peace? And at the same time, how can the media, particularly digital media, be leveraged to have an impact? That is the those are the questions that we'll be exploring this afternoon, and those are the questions that we explored in the online course. The wonderful thing about the media and the arts that I believe, and this is why I'm a believer, is because they are at the disposal of, of anyone, whether you're rich or poor, educated or not, young or old, everyone has these tools at their disposal for self-expression to help build peace. And that's why I am a, I am a believer. Not everyone should, no, not, and not everyone can or should ever use that reciprocating saw. But everyone in society can use the arts and the media to build peace. So with that, allow me to show a one minute promo video on the course that we're talking about, of which I said this, this event here is celebrating. So in the back, if you guys could cue up the video at this time, thank you. It is the extremists who understand the importance and value of culture. And they go after it and ban it. Fadi Mata said they want to ban music, they'll have to kill us first. So the arts can be simply uplifting and they can also take us through this ritual healing. Let's begin. are a powerful, specialized tool for building peace, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. More information about the courses in your program, you'll see a link on there to explore further. I also encourage you to connect with Honey and with Darren, who you just heard from, who were the masterminds behind this course. And I hope you enjoy the program that's ahead of you this afternoon. And with that, allow me to introduce to you the president of the United States Institute, Institute of Peace, Nancy Lindbergh. Nancy. Short person alert. Um, thank you, Dominic, and it is really a pleasure to be here with everybody. Welcome to U.S. Institute of Peace, and I should have thought through the fact that I was going to be introducing a program of arts and media and storytelling and, you know, come more prepared with the kind of razzle-dazzle that we're, and, and engaging stories that we're hearing today, but um, I am so delighted to have this partnership. I want to especially welcome and thank uh, Christiane Doucet and the partnership with, with your center in Geneva. It is a pleasure to be working with you um, and a pleasure to have a chance to launch this very powerful media and arts for peace. Um, 
I also want to thank the many artists uh, who have been engaged with this. Um, uh, and I have a special thanks to Hani Al Said. You were the, I uh, understand the, the catalyst and, and the brainstorm behind this. So thank you to you for all your hard work. Thank you to Darren and Dominic for, for translating this through our online campus into a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, thank you to the thousands and thousands of artists who are working around the world, artists, musicians, storytellers, who are actually employing their talents for the pursuit of building peace around the world. Um, for those of you who have not been here before, the United States Institute of Peace is a, is, it was founded by Congress a little over 30 years ago, um, dedicated to the proposition that peace is very, very practical that it is essential for our national and our international security, and most of all, that it is possible. And we work with partners around the world to seek nonviolent ways uh, to address the conflict that we know will be there. And it can either be transformative, channeled into productive change, or it can tear apart communities, families, and countries. Um, and so the partnership with the Geneva Center for Security po Policy on this course, I think really represents our shared commitments on finding all the ways in which we can help communities and societies and countries find those peaceful ways forward for the purpose of greater security. Um, I have really been seized by some of the new uh, neuroscience and cognitive research that tells us that when you have been exposed to prolonged conflict, it actually changes the architecture of your brain. And therefore, some of the more approaches to building peace through rational actor approaches will not necessarily help people who have been deeply traumatized. Um, and that's another extraordinary power and importance of using media arts and storytelling to really help people move out of that trauma for greater healing at the individual level so that you can build societal level peace going forward. So um, when we engage all of the emotions and all of the senses and really bring people to a different understanding, I think you create more powerful pathways forward. Um, we have seen all the ways uh, in which arts are so versatile. I again commend you to the exhibits. And I w before I introduce and bring up Christian, I want to just share a small story. And that is, uh, just this morning, I met with two young fellows who are here at USIP from South Sudan, uh, Ajin Gir and Francis Jor. And one is a Nuer and uh, one is a Dinka. And they are both here uh, because of their personal commitment to finding ways to help their country move out of what has been decades of conflict. And um, they are working in very difficult places in a country that is filled with, with terrible turmoil right now. And it's inspiring to hear what they're trying to do. And I wanted to note that uh, Ajing has taken every course on the global campus, every single course. And he is looking forward to this one um, and to being able to share it with the many peace builders uh, that he's trying to inspire in South Sudan. And so, you know, we sometimes forget about how lonely it can be when you're in a tough conflict environment, trying to build peace in your community and the power of being reached through music and stories and what that's able to do. So I commend everybody who's enabled this course. And now it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Ambassador Christian Doucet, our partner in this endeavor. He's the director of the Geneva uh, Center for Security Policy, and he was previously the Swiss ambassador and head of the Crisis Management Center of the F Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, um, it, during which time you coordinated a uh, government crisis response. So, so uh, he is no stranger to the kind of crises that have uh, turned so many countries into conflict zones. Um, and he has a long political career uh, that has, I think, only deepened your understanding and commitment to the need for peace. So please join me in welcoming a wonderful partner uh, and somebody who's truly committed to these issues, Ambassador Doucet.
So good afternoon, uh, good evening for our viewers who are from uh, Europe or, or Africa. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to, uh, to be here and to represent all my colleagues uh, in Geneva. Thank you so much, Nancy, for your kind words. It has been a privilege to work uh, with uh, USIP and all your team, Dominique, Darin, Hanyal Sayed, and all the others in making this, uh, this uh, event possible. The Geneva Center for Security Policy is a, uh, an international foundation that was created 20 years ago by a generous support from the Swiss government. And we have now in our board uh, 51 states, though all the member of the, or the permanent member of the Security Council are on the board of the foundation. And the mandate is to promote peace, security, and international cooperation, mainly through executive education and dialogue. And we are located in Geneva. And um, in coming here, I, I asked the taxi driver, I'm going to USIP. And, he's, and I said, this is on, on the mall, National Mall. He said, I, I know, I know the place. This is the fantastic building like that. I said, yes, yes, this is there. And Nancy, I can tell you, I'm as lucky as you, because um, in Geneva, we have uh, relocated to a brand new building three years ago, which is called the Maison de la Paix, the House of Peace. And the building is like yours, it's all transparent, and we can write, write on all the walls. But when you sit in our building, and for those of you who know Geneva, you see that uh, on the northern part of the city is what we call International Geneva. It's called so because it hosts 34 international organizations from WHO, UNHCR, WTO, 200, so 34 international organizations. We host also 250 NGOs. And if you turn around in the building and look south towards the lake, then you have one of the major financial centers of the world with the banks, the traders, you have uh, also the civil society, the local population. When we, but when you are in a building and you look around, you see that everyone works in a silo. A lot of those pipes and people have difficulties in working together because we are so specialized in one in our field that we tend to forget that something sensational is happening just 200 meters from you. And so part of our mandate is also to, uh, to uh, build bridges, to destroy the barriers, the stovepipes. And we do that uh, in our building, for example. And uh, we uh, have a specialty is we bring uh, opposite together. So it's not uncommon that you see in the classrooms at GCSP an American official and a North Korean, a representative for Amnesty International sitting next to someone from the defense industry, or Greenpeace sitting next to someone from a pharma company. And this is where we provide a platform for them to uh, build bridges, to uh, update their knowledge, uh, gain new skills, uh, hone their tools, in order to be more performer, uh, more effective in dealing with peace and security uh, issues. And so part of this activity for us to foster collaboration, foster creativity and build trust is also using the power of the media. We all know that the media are powerful. We all know that the arts is also very powerful. And so bringing together, combining these together will prove to be something very impactful. And so this is why we, uh, at the beginning, and this is where I want to thank and, and recognize Hania Sayed. I met her by chance uh, a few years ago while I was uh, giving a lecture at Fletcher. And she was in the class, and after the class, I discussed with her, and I discovered a very talented individual. But she also had lost everything. She was, for the second time of her life, a refugee. Because of war, because of a conflict, she has to leave her country, Syria. But I also saw in her a lot of potential. And so we decided at GCSP that how can we provide support for this individual in order to foster her ideas in having a combination of media and the arts and having that an impact uh, on the world. And we are here today and with all my colleagues in Geneva, we are happy and amazed to see what kind of project she was able to brought forward. And it's also give us a further ideas is to, um, uh, to give us a new kind of activities or new mission at the center is to enable uh, uh, individuals who have been affected by war conflict or are executives from the private sector in transition and want to do something else in their life to give them a platform when they can reflect, they can pose, they can um, 
uh, think and what they want to do, maybe develop a project that we as a foundation can support as we go forward. So it's a delight to be here and a delight to be partnering with USIP in order to bring this uh, fantastic project forward. And I wish you a fruitful and very inspirational afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Doucet. Thank you, President Lindborg. Thank you, Dominic. And now I'd like to move to our first story of the afternoon. And so I'd like to invite my fellow MC, Honey Al Sayed, up to the stage here. And a quick note is that uh, I've known Honey for about four years at this point. And anyone who knows her, um, even if you've only known her for a minute, knows that she is incredibly kind. She is unbelievably creative and amazingly intelligent. Um, and all of those characteristics are born out of an amazing story, which she'll share with you now. Thank Thanks. you. That heartbeat. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Darren, it's, it's a privilege to be standing by your side today on this platform at the Hub of Peace, USIP. I don't know what's going on behind me. Okay, I didn't choose these pictures. <laughs> so, um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, it, it was really a privilege to co-develop this course and, and to work for the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the USIP Global Campus for the Media Arts uh, for Peace online course. And I'm very thankful to GCSP and USIP for allowing me the creative safe space for providing me with community support, for your empathy, and for your trust in me. Uh, I am very grateful to that forever. And this honorable opportunity to be actually standing here. So this course is very personal to me because my life has been an amalgam of conflict and peace. And it was through creativity and creative spaces that I was able to make sense of it all. And when I say creativity, it's not limited to art. So my first exposure to a creative and entrepreneurial world has been through the lens of my immediate family, who I think are watching online right now in Syria, Kuwait, if there's electricity in Syria and um, UK and the US, so I salute them if they are watching and I love you to death. So this was my first exposure and that exposure is a world of uh, fashion, art curation, photography and advertising. I was born and raised in Kuwait to Syrian parents and in 1990 following the Iraqi invasion to Kuwait, this was the first time I was displaced and separated from my family to then have to go to Egypt and finish my American high school there. In 1991-92, I found myself in post-Civil War Lebanon. As a Syrian, I didn't make much friends. And it was a difficult time, uh, then at least. But I did graduate from the Lebanese uh, American University and my undergrad was in radio, TV, film, and theater. Moving on, I, like everybody that graduates, I needed to launch my career, went across the Middle East, um, looking for a life and, and doing things here and there, finally arriving in Syria in the fall of 2000, and that's where my career soared. But that too was hijacked, and so, this is why I'm here standing today. And six years ago, I would have never thought I'd be in the United States of America, let alone on this platform doing this. So I'm really honored. Um, but six years ago, before the United States became my fifth home, I had a morning show and it was a morning show called Good Morning Syria, which was inspired from Good Morning Vietnam, Robin Williams, anybody seen that movie? I can see which generation saw that movie. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen the movie, I urge you, please see it. It's an amazing movie. 
uh, and it did uh, influence my decisions with the radio show at least. And this show, having that opportunity to say good morning Syria every day in a three hour daily live show, I can't tell you the amazing feeling that was. And it was an interactive show uh, and it broadcast to millions of Syrians across Syria. And I was often invited to the United States to speak about the power of media through my firsthand experience um, on the social and cultural reform impact and influence that it can have, because I understood it through the power of the microphone that I had for over a decade. And I can tell you it was such a responsibility. A responsibility that has forced me to leave Syria, my home, to leave my family, to leave my friends, my colleagues, my career, and here I am today. Um, and since I arrived in January 18, 2012, in the United States, it's a date I will never forget, I helped found Suriali. Suriali means Syria is mine. And it also means surreal, as in how we feel about what's going on back home. Suriali is an independent online radio that works on fostering peace building, reconciliation, and democracy. And if Suriali can get two warring factions to like their Facebook page and say that this is their voice, then they're doing something right. Moving on, I became a creative consultant and a producer and in 2014, I was granted a full scholarship to and earned a master's, an executive master's degree in international affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And at that point, with my life being infused with change and turbulence and conflict and with it media and arts and their power, and now international affairs, I was like, okay, my thesis is going to be about the role of media and the arts amid the Syrian, Afghan, and Bosnian conflicts. And I found through my research that changing mindsets, shaping behaviors and attitudes are at the core of peace building. And that peace building scholars and practitioners are increasingly recognizing that sustainable peace requires more than cognitive and rational engagement. I also found that the arts and media actually flourish in conflict. I'm a good example. <laughs> but I can tell you there are thousands of media and arts initiatives that flourished in Syria alone in the past six years, like never before in history. There are over a hundred media outlets that emerged in Syria. That was in only the first three years I lost count at this point. So, with the knowledge of the power of media that was also deepened through my radio experience, Come the Arab uprisings, as they unfold, I witness how journalists, media presenters, myself included, poets, filmmakers, peaceful activists, posed a dangerous threat to authoritarian regimes and to warring factions. And that led to those media and arts people to go into exile because they became targets that could experience either torture, imprisonment, and even death. And that is why my passion for those creative tools have developed even further, and why I'm so privileged to be standing here today, and why we have our guests today that are gonna show and tell and perform from their own experiences on what media and the arts can do for peace. And with that, I want to welcome Aaron Schneier, who is the president and founder of uh, Heartbeat. There he is with his guitar. And Heartbeat is an organization that brings together Israeli and Palestinian youth to create and perform music. Welcome, Aaron.
Thank you all so much for having me. It's a true honor. Um, I'd like to invite a special friend who um, I didn't realize he'd be in town. In fact, it's a nice surprise. Um, dear friend Muhammad Mugrabi, who is uh, one of the more one of the most prominent Palestinian rappers, who's been integral in the work I've done over the last uh, ten years, um, and we're really lucky to have him here in D.C. So I wanted to share this first song um, with Muhammad, if that's all right. Tell me everything you know, the love you've been shown, and the hopes you want to grow. So hand me, hand me any bag you want. I will open it to if I never do. You know I am part of you. But now we sail far away from here to the land of better years. Jerusalem, all eyes on you. You've got the power to show us all what's true. Jerusalem, all eyes on you. You've got the power to show us all what's true. لا 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 ما بدناش يا حرب ما بدناش الضرب بين بني آدم على الأرض بحلم بحياة فيش فيها جنود فيش فيها حدود فيها كتير ورود وناسها بعيشوا عشان عمرو كلها عمل ولا مرة بدمرو بتاخد زي ما بتعطي بتعطي زي ما بتاخد بلزمهاش مؤتمرات وتعاهد لقيم تبد من ضل تحت السيطرة خايفين من الموت يجي من ورا أنا بكره كل واحد سياسي هو وصحابه القاعدين على الكراسي ولا كروح خلص اطلع من راسي بكفيش قد ما عشنا مقاسي الإنسان إنسان وين مكان الإنسان إنسان مين مكان and mothers always know how to get us here and get us there and get us to next year yeah. i see the waves pull us to the moon the promised land so near we could be there soon it's a fault line it's your fault line it's all up to you there's no pressure no pressure except all the people counting on you every smokestack and every smoking gun Turn by turn. Every time we stay silent while they feed us lies, we can make our money, but we won't be alive. Jerusalem, all lies on you. You've got the power to show us all what's true. Jerusalem, all eyes on you. You've got the power to show us all what's true. So sad, what is going on? Where is the love and all the humanity gone? Who is responsible? I don't care. I just want to feel secure here and there, Palestine. On my mind all the time, Israel too. It's on my mind all the time. Who is right? Who is wrong? I don't want to get into this. And the truth is that people can live together, no matter where, no matter who, no matter how. First of all, we need to get rid of the control of the minds of the people and destroy all the walls. You have to face it cause nobody was born racist. The fact is that our ideology raised it on all of us. Our victims of the system think what you can get and what you got. Trust me, I don't create another fuck y'all. One, there's one for us all. Yes, there's one, one. Yes, there's one, one for us all. Yes, there's one, one. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, you want to say anything now? Or just what you said, or you want to sit back up here? Okay. Muhammad's going to join us again in a little bit. Thank yeah. you, Muhammad. Thank you. It's a real treat to have him here. So I wanted to share a little bit about my story and about Heartbeat, and, and then we'll uh, watch a little video from some of our musicians, and then I'll share a bit more. Um, and then I'll get to talk to Honey, yes. Um, so I grew up here in the D.C. area in, in Rockville, Maryland, and grew up in a family of musicians and activists. And from the time I was very young, um, as I developed this passion for music, was also developing this passion for social justice and, and finding ways to, to work to, to make the world a better place. Um, after graduating from Georgetown undergrad, I, I headed to New York to pursue my music career and quickly felt that um, there was, I wanted something more than dragging my friends out to see me at, at these clubs or bars or wherever, and really wanted to see what power music had to, to, to repair the world. And um, in 2007, I received a Fulbright MTVU fellowship to study the power of music to build mutual understanding. Um, a really life-changing opportunity to go to Jerusalem and create an ensemble of Israeli and Palestinian youth, high school students from East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, um, youth who otherwise would never have an opportunity to meet each other and probably not even an opportunity to meet someone from the other side as an equal and set out that year to create this band of 12 musicians. We worked through the year, um, made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot, um, had a great time, and, and really felt that we couldn't stop. And for the past 10 years, we've been continuing to organize these, these efforts. Over 120 youth have come together through our program. Um, and today, our, our core program creates ensembles of high school students in Jerusalem and in Haifa. And as we grow, we hope to bring our program to many other cities. But they engage in, in a critical dialogue about the realities they face and raise awareness through this dialogue. And they engage in, in music co-creation, where they're studying the musical styles and the, the cultural richness of each, of each musician bringing whatever style of music they love, if it's hip hop or if it's classical music, jazz, folk music, Arabic music, you name it, and, and meshing these together um, to create something really original. They write their own songs, which fuse that understanding from the dialogue. And then when they're ready, they go out in their community and, and share their understanding, share their, their hopes, their ideas, their questions, and an attempt to, to promote uh, change to the to the way things are. Um, I'd like to turn now to a video. Um, is that queued up? Which is, um, I guess, a highlights reel of a recent tour we did in. speak in the language of violence, in the language of war and fear. I feel that I'm occupied and I'm in heartbeat because I'm against the occupation. I'm against segregation, I'm against the inequality. The people up there, they're using fear and violence to separate us. So I want to use my tool, which is music and love, to fight them back. Get me out of here. Music can pass a hard message through a good sound. Who do you think you're doing it? Who oh, 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 do, oh, do you think you're doing it? Who oh, do you think you're doing it? Who oh, do, oh, do you think you're doing it? Who oh, do you think you're doing it?
Our musicians, they start out in our program really diving deep into music and building, building trust um, through the music. And then taking that, those, this experience, I think the foundation that's built through music, they're then able to go deeper into, into a dialogue about really difficult things, about the occupation, about the different narratives, about um, what it means to go to the army, like really, really touching on the, the most sensitive and difficult issues, which I think most programs like ours, um, these are, this is the moments when musicians start to shout and start to, the group falls apart and you can see the factions and the, the, the divisions. But I think through music, through Heartbeat, we've, we've been able to create this foundation of understanding and of respect where people can share very deeply um, their truth without it interfering with someone else's truth. And there's this understanding um, and desire to really listen and respect one another. Um, I think that opens up space for a much deeper understanding. And, and through that understanding, we, not just understanding, but also empathy. And also, um, I think through that, the musicians come out of this experience with a sense of responsibility and a sense of ability to, to co-resist, to work together, to change things. Um, and the second power of music that I wanted to share about is really about the power to amplify. And you know, we know that less than 1% of Israelis and Palestinians have come together for a sustained, meaningful dialogue process where they can really build relationships as equals. And it's my belief that until we reach a critical mass, which many point to as being 25% of the population, until that, that critical mass has come to trust and respect one another as, they, as, they, as equals, then we're not gonna see the transformation we need to see. So I think within music, um, there's a tremendous power to bring this experience that our musicians are having to millions of people um, through multimedia publications, through concerts, through workshops, and um, I think that's, um, an important, important way forward. I wanted to bring Muhammad back up now. Um, and as he's coming up, maybe I'll teach you guys. Maybe you'll, you'll sing with us. What do you think? Okay, so the song is pretty simple. So just repeat after me. No, we won't. No, we won't. Oh, like, yeah, all right, there we go. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. Of our sisters. The last one's a little confusing to repeat, so just repeat the first three. It sounds better. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. Be afraid. Be afraid. Of our brothers. Of our brothers. Okay, I think you got it. Ready? Wake up, the sun is warm and shining in. But my dreams are so much more comforting. Wake up, the streets are calling your name. Walls are being built, climb them or we lose the game. I don't want to run away from you. I don't want to run away from you. Put the lock on your front door, build a fence around your house, build walls to your cities so they won't get in and we won't get out. X-ray machines and chips in our shoulders, pay them to build us new security measures, pay to build us afraid of ourselves, afraid of ourselves, afraid of ourselves. No, we won't, no, we won't, no, we won't, no, we won't be afraid, be afraid 
of our sisters. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. No, we won't. Be afraid. Be afraid. Any longer. Cause I don't want to run away from you. Don't just read the headlines that make us so numb. I'm a Palestinian refugee, and that's why I got my energy. I'll do it right. No, don't do it wrong. I'm going to start my peace right here. I'll send my love everywhere. Join the air, no. No more fear, no. No matter what happens, just keep smiling. Believe in love and love everything. Come on, work it. Let me see you work it. Clap your hands in the air and sing it. Celebrate and start peace right here. No matter where, cause peace starts here. Deep inside me, I'm feeling it. When I look in your eyes, I can see it. So come on, do it. It's easy to get it. Tell her, bring it, make it spread it everywhere. This is great. <laughs> wow. All right, I'm I'm gonna hijack you <laughs> for two more minutes, if that's all right. Yeah, you can. No, for you. Thank you. That was you. remarkable, so and for engaging everybody uh, with us today. Uh, I hope those online were singing as well, right after you. <laughs> So I just got a few questions for you. Um, what are the challenges that you face to bring all of this together and have the continuum of it, you know, going, moving forward? There's yep. a lot of challenges. I think the two biggest ones, um, one is just, just financial, just the reality of a startup organization making this work happen. Um, I don't think I need to <laughs> say much more. Um, the other is, is uh, I guess you could say political. I think there's a lot of fear around this kind of effort. There's, um, I think, a deep misunderstanding um, by, by many people of what this kind of work is, and what, especially what Heartbeat is, where many people look at this effort of bringing Israelis and Palestinians together and say that this is normalizing the status quo, or normalizing the occupation, and whitewashing the inequalities that exist. And, and um, what do you say to that? I say a lot of things. I'll try to be, <laughs> be quick about it. Um, I think fundamentally, we're working to, to empower youth. 
And through the programs, they're becoming more critically aware. They're becoming empowered to navigate their futures in a, in a deeper and stronger way. And that's it. I think yeah. through the dialogues, we're addressing those realities and, and exposing our young people to, mm -hmm. to an understanding that otherwise they wouldn't have. Um, and the financial support, is that because there's skepticism around what you're doing? Certainly, there's skepticism, there's fear just around getting involved in a controversial issue. Like we've tried engaging the music industry and we still hope to if you're out there listening. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, I think there's a tremendous power that, that the media and arts industries have to, to, to use their, their resources to promote peace around the world. Um, our particular conflict is rather controversial and I think it scares some, away some people. So you talked about the power of dialogue, you talked about the power of the creative space itself and the, and the, and the process of actually creating and what it does. Um, and, and you talked about the narratives. Where does strategy come in? Why is it important to be strategic when you are doing the work that you do? It'd be, it, there's so much work to do and I think the, for me, the biggest issue is about being focused about what we choose to bite off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly, you know, we would love to have our programs in, in hundreds of cities around the world, but we know that if we want to make a deep impact, we need to focus in a few places to start and, and really make sure everything is aligned towards that goal. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talked about amplification of the work you do, is the media even concerned? Are they interested? How do you get their attention? It's a good question. Um, we're not as successful as violence at getting the media's attention, but I do as think... As violence? Sure. Yeah, but I do think um, we, have, we have had some considerable success. I think because of music, you know, where our... our also, I think because the music is, is good, like the, the young people are creating great music, and that attracts people and lets them know that this is serious and that this is not just a, a cute kids project, but... Yeah. Um, and you focus a lot on youth. How about adults? We all, we're really a growing community. So, so the majority of, of the people in the community have come in when they were in high school, and now okay. the oldest are now 26 years old. Um, and we want to keep engaging them. And all our right. facilitators in the extended community, um, you know, these people as adults, I think, have a tremendous power. And okay. of course, we want to leverage that too. So my last question to you is, what was the most powerful concert that you've had and, and the impact that it's had? Wow. That's a hard question. All of them? <laughs> um, it's hard to scroll through my mind right now. I, um, a memorable the One moment. story I often share, I mean, um, I think it's, the, for me, the exciting part about the performance is it's a space for the young musicians in our program to actually demonstrate the understanding, the skills that they've been learning, and to see them take the mic as leaders and, and, and bring out their voices and, and argue for their, mm -hmm. their views, um, that for me is, is really powerful. And of course, seeing a band come together and, um, actually, and, make it happen. and actually make it happen is really powerful. And of course, the audiences, um, we've had really powerful feedback from many of them, many who've never heard someone from the other side talk about peace and justice in this, in this way, and if, you know, by just hearing them on, on, on stage that night, they, um, their opinions have really shifted and their hope for the future has grown. So, oh, Thank you, Aaron, that was, and, and thank you for the music, thank you for your friend. Thank <laughs> you so wonderful. much. Thank you. Thank you all. Aaron, it's always a pleasure to hear the story of your work, your journey, and of course your music as well. You also check out Heartbeat um, online. Their album is available on iTunes, and uh, it, it really is inspiring. So thank you very much. Uh, next, I am going to invite Mazi Mutafa up on stage to lead us all in an activity. Uh, Mazi is the executive director of an organization called Words, Beats, and Life. And they're actually based here in Washington, D.C., and they do a lot of work in the region, and they also do a lot of work around the world. 
where they bring together uh, hip hop culture, the peace, love, unity, and fun of hip hop culture to work with communities in building positive change. And so actually, before I bring them up on stage, just to give you all a sense of the depth and breadth of the work that Words, Beats, and Life does, I'd like to show this short video. Good afternoon, everybody. So as was said, my name is Mazi Mutafa. I'm the executive director of a small nonprofit here in Washington, DC called Words, Beats, and Life. And um, out of curiosity, how many people know the artistic elements of hip hop that are in the room? We've seen one. Oh, no, you know all of them. I know you know the rest of them, Muhammad. Anybody, anybody back there? Anybody? This is where you call it. This is call and response. Yes, tell, you can yell it out. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. DJing would be one of the four. We saw Muhammad doing another one of them on stage. We got rapping. We saw these pictures that are up here. What is, what's this? There's graffiti, and there's one more. 
which would be breakdancing. Those are the four basic artistic elements of hip hop. There are other things that have been added, including beatboxing, um, fashion, entrepreneurship, etc. But the fifth element from the very beginning of hip hop was knowledge of self. So this idea of knowing who you are and your relationship to the rest of human history. Um, and we see that manifest in things like um, the kinds of music that were played early on in the, in the inception of, of hip hop. So my workshop with you is actually a writing workshop. It's less me performing or talking and more you all actually meeting your neighbors. We're gonna spend about the next 15 minutes um, preparing you for, to become an artist. Actually, are there any artists in the room? Okay. Just for future reference, if, if you're ever in an audience and someone asks if there are any artists in the room, every single person should raise their hand because the arts are not just these things in our pictures, they're things like the culinary arts. So I'm sure almost everybody in this room knows how to make food for themselves or burn some food for themselves. Okay, so that means you're, you're a junior culinary artist. Everybody in the room is dressed which means that you know how to put together clothing. You might not have designed it, but, but being able to put it together is actually a, a talent in and of itself. So thinking about yourself as an artist, as a creative. So what I want you to do, um, we're gonna spend three and a half minutes. Everybody needs to pick one person sitting next to them to be able to answer this question. Um, the question is, when did you first realize that you have privilege? And you can define privilege however you want. But when did you first, as a human being living on the planet Earth in 2017, realize that you had privilege? So I want you to turn to your neighbor. You're going to spend the next three and a half minutes describing that experience, who you were talking to, what you were talking about, where you were. And for, hold up, hold up. And for the person that's listening, there's paper underneath your, underneath your chair um, and a pen. I want you to actually take notes about the story that the person's telling you. All right? So you're going to have three and a half minutes to listen to one person tell their story. And uh, for my friends watching online, since you don't have someone to talk to, what I'd love for you to do is take out a piece of paper and draw the scene. Draw the, the first time you remember realizing you had privilege. And then you're gonna share that on social media at the hashtag. Don't forget the person that's listening is supposed to be taking notes.
So whoever's talking should be wrapping up their story. You've got 15 seconds left. Everyone should be wrapping up their story. And I call time. All right. So, because this is uh, intended to be a dialogue, not just a monologue, now what we're going to do is have the person that was listening, they're going to answer the same question. And the person that just got done talking, you're going to take notes on what it is that they say. So you're literally just switching responsibilities. Cool. We're going to do this for three more minutes, and then we're going to get to the next part of the activity. For the person listening, don't forget to take notes. And if you're watching on the internet, don't forget, you are able to draw something and tag the hashtag. That's media arts piece, hashtag media arts piece. got one minute left. <laughs> 30 seconds, you should be wrapping up your story.
All right, everybody should be wrapping up their story because our time is up. Everybody ready? Everybody ready for the next step? So I think maybe sometimes people, some of the people in the audience might be wondering, why does this guy have us sharing our story about privilege at an arts convening? And part of the answer is that um, the work that we do in the United States and we do around the world is about um, encouraging young people and not so young people to understand the centrality of their own story to whatever it is they want to do. So understanding things, how you, how you think about your life and its trajectory around any question. I ask about privilege because that allows you to learn what privilege is potentially higher up in the hierarchy for the person you were talking to. So whether you talked about gender privilege, whether you talked about orientation privilege, national privilege, economic privilege, racial privilege, that what it is that they decide to tell you in that moment says something about things that they're concerned about, things they're thinking about. And for most of you, I'm pretty sure the person you talked to was a stranger. So having that kind of a conversation in a community of strangers. So our friend from um, Artbeat talked from Heartbeat talked about um, building bridges um, and knocking down walls. Basically, this kind of conversation, this kind of willingness to be vulnerable with a stranger, is a is a fundamental building block. So now, what I'd like for each of you to do is the person that took the notes to give it to the person who 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 you were writing about. So now you get to see what from your, whoever, <laughs> yes, give the notes to the person whose story you listen to. So part of the reason why we ask you to, everybody listening? Because there's one more step. Part of the reason why we ask you to share the, the notes is because one, you're now going to see what that person actually heard that you said and took the time to write. The next step is I'm actually going to ask each of you to do something that maybe you've never done before, which is to write a poem inspired by just the words in the notes that they took. So you literally have to write a poem only using the notes that they took. All right. So we're going to take four minutes because maybe you're not used to writing poetry. I'm going to give you four minutes to, to retell your story using the words of your listener. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? If it, if it doesn't make sense, feel free to throw your paper at me. Good, no paper. All right, so we're going to take four minutes to write a poem about you using someone else's words. All right, so this is, this is individual work time. So you can use that same piece of paper or use a different piece of paper, but you're going to write a poem about, about your own privilege using someone else's words. We're going to begin. Yes. Only the words that they, that they wrote down. So you can add no additional words. So if you got a terrible note taker, you're going to have a very short poem. All right? This is, this is one on one. This is by yourself work. <laughs> you can complain to them about their notes later. So we're down to three and a half minutes to write a poem about yourself. No, you can you, you, you choose the words. It's just that's your total lexicon of words to be used.
two minutes. So hopefully our friends on the internet are posting their pictures to the hashtag media arts peace. One more minute. Everybody should be wrapping up their poem. If you wrote one. All right, so here's, here's a, my next question is, is there a brave soul in the audience who wants to take the microphone? All right, so before, so we've got, we've got one, two people. Got you in the back. So we've got two people, both of y'all can come on, come on down. You're the next contestant. Oh, no. Okay. So, part of the reason why I wanted to do this exercise is because usually when people talk about the arts, um, particularly um, as a peace strategy or as a community development strategy, that usually what they talk about is this idea of creating spaces for self-expression. Um, this activity could be used um, the way that I did it with you all, but it could also be if you're working with communities that are not necessarily um, super literate. They, this activity could have been, the notes could have actually been drawings. It could have been listening and thinking about songs that the story reminded them of, that they could then share. So thinking about this idea of an exchange between people um, to build bridges. So, come on up. Shavanya? Shavanya. Let's give one more round of applause. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Shivanya. I work at the Georgetown Lab with uh, Derek Goldman and Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, who will be speaking later. Um, so I guess from the, the poem I wrote from the words that my partner wrote, I guess I'll read it to you now. OK. Um, day to day at home, friends have more privilege. Travel, passport privilege. Don't like black people overseas. Passport privilege, American. So. That's my poem. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Shoa Philpotts, and I work with a nonprofit organization called Little Friends for Peace. Um, so, this is my poem Dad, screen printer, privilege. Do that, did dance camp, privilege. Ninth grade showed me how privileged I was to have a family. Privilege, didn't see it as a privilege to have a family. Privilege, access to things others struggle to obtain. Privilege. So one of the things you'll be able to say, every, well, everyone that participated did today, is you'll be able to walk away and say, I went to a conference and wrote a poem. Feel free to share that at the hashtag Media Arts Peace, if you feel like typing that up. Um, the only other thing I didn't say was the video that played was a, of a festival we host here in Washington, D.C. We've worked around the world in Brazil and Pakistan, Lebanon, Uganda, South Africa this summer, China next year, um, Brussels, and Paris. So many of the things that we do in, the, in Washington, D.C., 
we do abroad, particularly when we talk about the work with young people, we talk about promoting five outcomes, skill set mastery, employability, the pursuit of a post-secondary education, community, and self-mastery. A lot of times, again, when people talk about the arts, they don't talk about the commerce of the arts, this idea that young people on, on a, at, at its most basic level are looking for opportunities to express themselves, but at a deeper level, looking for ways to be the economic engine in their, in their own life. So thinking about the, the commercial value of what it is that the arts creates, not just the, the expressive value, I think is super important as we think about the way that we engage young people in communities around the arts. Um, so when um, Heartbeats is taking young people on a tour, there, I'm sure there are young people on that tour who also want to learn how do I put together a tour, not just be the artist on it. So when, we, when we're thinking about ways for young people and communities to be transformed, we should also be thinking about the commercial opportunities that exist if they're properly um, taught and trained and networked. That's where the community piece comes in. So give yourselves a round of applause. Mazi, thank you for facilitating this experience for us. Uh, now I want to delve a little bit into your story. Um, so my first question is, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Um, so it's funny, I actually didn't grow up as a hip hop kid. Um, I was actually someone that listened to the R&B that my mother played. So I listened to way more Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye until college. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, Hip hop was less about the music and more about the culture. Um, my mother was in the Air Force as a child, so uh, when I was a child, so I would spend my summers coming back to the United States to visit her family in New York City. So um, the thing that was my hook was this book by an author named Trisha Rose called Black Noise. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's a book about the soundscape of hip hop, the sounds of, of subway cars, the sounds of honking, cabs in New York City, and that was what I actually related to, literally the aesthetic of hip hop, more so than the actual cultural artifacts of it, if that makes sense. And so uh, I, met, I, I was introduced to that book when I went to sit in on a class at the University of Maryland called African American Studies 202 Blacks in Popular Culture. And it was the very first time in my entire life where I was sitting in a classroom and I felt like things that I valued were valued. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what we work to do is to create those kinds of classroom, alternative classroom spaces for young people where the things that matter to them are put at the center, that their stories put at the center. And ultimately that's what we see hip hop as, as, as a, a way of um, locating people and connecting them across geographies, across religious identities, orientation identities, that ultimately it's not about um, who you, who, who you specifically are, but how it is that who you specifically are relates to the rest of the human family. And what's the name of that, that book again, so people can share it if they're so it, inclined? It's actually a pretty old book. There's yeah. been several since, but there's an author named Trisha Rose. The book is called Black Noise. Um, it's one of the first real academic books about hip hop. Um, yeah. That's right. We may have gone to college around the same time. Um, <laughs> I remember that book, very powerful book. Um, so, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you started Words, Beats, and Life not soon after you first fell in love with hip-hop after reading Trisha Rose's book. Can you give us a timeline in terms of when you started to understand that soundscape to then figuring out this is an, uh, something around which I want to build an organization? Yeah, so, uh, so part of my story is I got accepted to the University of Maryland right after I graduated from high, high school, but wasn't going to go because I hated high school. And so I kind of thought college was like high school, except you live there, and who wants to live at high school? Um, so then I went to this class, and I, and I decided to enroll the next semester. So that was um, 2005, 2006, and Words, Beats, and Life is now 15 years old. I founded it after being a student leader on the college campus, creating a hip-hop uh, conference that then when I graduated, it turned into a nonprofit back in 2002. Um, and it's not so much that, that hip-hop that I fell in love with hip hop as, as much as is that I realized that hip hop had always been a part of my life. And it was like literally reading books and, 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 and engaging people that thought about it that helped me to see the connections between, things I, the, between the things I was already doing and the things I wanted to do. Um, as an organization, we talk about this idea of the purpose of an education is to help a, a human being see the connection between what they do and the whole of human history. 
So literally, from the way that this room is set up to the technology we're using has a history. There's, it, it didn't just pop up. So helping a young person to understand why it is that the things they're learning in their school and things they're learning in their community have value and how they can apply to their life is ultimately what we exist to do, to act as guides, people that have already been down a particular path who can let you know that there's a couple of booby traps up the road to avoid them, um, to ideally go further than we were able to go. So there are five main programs to Words, Beats, and Life, one of which is the embassy. Can you tell us about the embassy? So the embassy, um, probably beginning uh, seven years ago, we had uh, an MC who was in country from Uganda. His name is Saba Saba. He got into the cab of a friend of mine, and that friend was like, you know, you're an MC. Oh, you have to meet Mazi. He runs this group called Words, Beats, and Life. And so we met Saba Saba. Saba Saba invited us to come to Uganda. It took us two years to find the money. And then what year is this? This is. Um, 2012. Okay. Um, well, 2012 is when we went. 2010 is when we met him. Okay. Um, and so we went and did our first trip to Uganda, taking artists to do master classes. And, and over time, basically what that's evolved to is doing master classes because that's what it is that generally people are asking for from abroad. But then that evolved into doing capacity building. So um, one of the most recent projects we had was working in Lebanon with an organization called Cross Arts. And we helped them develop their first strategic plan, developing marketing strategies, all kinds of things that help build the infrastructure of the organization um, around fundraising, marketing, like how to actually be a healthy organization that provides great opportunities for young people, whether they're um, Lebanese nationals or refugees. Um, and the same thing is true uh, with projects we've done in Brussels, the projects we've done, or we're going to be doing this summer in South Africa. Because for us, it's not just about um, expression. Because ultimately, one of the things that we've found over the years is that if you give a young person a stage and a microphone and an opportunity, the next question becomes, when's the next one? And if you're not able as an organization to answer that, right. that's, that's actually OK. But they should be able to answer that themselves through a process that says, we are not your last stop in this journey called your life. We are just one step that should be able to give you the tools, experiences, relationships, networks, to be able to be the driving force behind, behind what's possible for your life. It's why one of our outcomes is self-mastery, this idea that um, you can be the driving force behind what's possible, as opposed to just the subject of circumstances and happenstance. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. So you started the organization in 2000? 2000. 2002. 2002. So about eight years, nine years go by before you start doing your first work internationally. Right. So you're doing a lot of work here domestically in the United States, I assume also in the mostly D.C., Maryland area? Mostly D.C. D.C., Maryland, okay, mostly D.C. area. Did you learn anything new about hip-hop and hip-hop culture, or did you view hip-hop and hip-hop culture any differently once you started taking words, beats, and life into other countries? So I think that there's a couple of different ways that people do kind of um, culture-based work um, that have their own values, depending on who it is that the person or people are. Um, one of, <laughs> I'm a big fan of listening to what other people say about things that matter to me. So there's a documentary that we screened, I want to say six years ago, called um, Hip Hop Colony, and it was about the idea of people using hip hop as a form of cultural imperialism. So this idea that people are exporting American culture mm. um, as a kind of uh, neo-colonialism. And so that's a critique. So one of the things that we did as an organization in thinking about how we would go abroad is to not go abroad and say, well, this is how we do it in America, so this is how you should do it here, but really to ask, how do you do it here? What's the impact that you have? Mm. How are you connected to previous artistic traditions of your own country? Because ultimately, I think one of the biggest or mo most valuable things we do abroad is ask artists in other countries to value their culture um, the same way that the generations that sampled funk records that produced early hip hop valued the music of their parents, of previous generations. And so that hip hop is ultimately an intergenerational dialogue, whether that is through the dance Great, a great movie for you to watch if you're really interested in this. Um, it's on YouTube called From Mambo to Hip Hop, talking about early Latin dances and their mm -hmm. impacts on b-boying. There's tons of books about um, 
various kinds of visual culture, storytelling that influence graffiti, whether that's calligraphy, um, whether that's various Asian scripts that are all large scale letter based forms that then manifest themselves as graffiti, or whether that is the various musical traditions that inform the work of the DJ or the MC, that hip hop is ultimately a relabeling of something that is intrinsic to the entire human family. This idea of the drum, mm -hmm. this idea of storytelling, this idea of retelling the history of where it is you're from and valuing that place and the people that are a part of it. And so when we go abroad, we, we spend most of our time trying to learn how, they under, how the artists that we're engaging or the arts, arts managers or organizers think about themselves in relationship to their larger community. Mm -hmm. In some instances, they view themselves as um, disconnected. And so we ask, well, that's not, we say to, that's not, that's not hip hop as we understand it. If you're not connected to the work of your, or to the art of your parents and grandparents, that's not really rooted in the tradition of hip hop. Like hip hop is that. It's rooted in pre, the work um, and artifacts of previous generations that part of what you have to do is learn about the past if you're going to create something new in the present to inspire the future. That's great, that's great. <laughs> So I got one last, one last question for you, and uh, I want you to help everyone in this audience start their first hip hop playlist or add to their already existing hip hop playlist. <laughs> and you know, you mentioned the uh, four core elements of hip hop, one of which is you know MCing and, and rapping. And so, are there any songs, tracks, or artists that, to someone who wants to understand the peace, love, unity element of hip hop culture? could turn to, to really get a sense of, of, of that. Yeah, I mean, so, it's funny. Um, so, so I, I usually love to use the words of rappers to explain rap music, so my favorite, my, well, I don't have a favorite, um, but one of my favorite artists is uh, this guy named Andre 3000, mm -hmm. and he has a, a line where he says, I met a critic and made her mess her draws. She said she thought hip hop was only guns and alcohol. Mm. I said, oh, hell no. But yet it's that too. You can't discriminate because you don't read a book or two. So, so part of my challenge is like, what's on the, like most people who would be on a stage like this would say, oh, what's on the radio, it's terrible. Yeah. It doesn't represent my culture. It's, and that's their opinion. I actually have a broader understanding of who my community is and my responsibility as a part of a community to own not only what I think is amazing, but also what I think is terrible, um, because it's still produced by people that are part of my community. Um, so I would say the first place to start would be um, the radio. And the radio because that's what most people are actually listening to. Then the second thing I would do if you were trying to curate a playlist is I would go to a format like a SoundCloud mm -hmm where the, the system is set up so that if you pick a song, it gives you multiple songs that are kind of in that vein. So if you like, for example, A Tribe Called Quest, um, you can type in A Tribe Called Quest and look up particular songs by particular artist. I think it's less about picking an individual thing versus seeing the value in the tapestry of experiences and points of view, um, some of which are destructive some of which are uplifting, but all of it is a part of the culture. Whether, whether the people who are part of the community and culture want it to be or not, hip hop doesn't have a hierarchy where, people, where there's a group of people who get to say, these people over here, they're not really the thing, and this group of people over here is. There are people who like to think like that, but, but the reality is that the full spectrum of experience is part of where at least I see the value. From the most hideous to the most beautiful, represents a full spectrum of human experience. And I think that the thing that's most important to me is that hip hop creates a space for that full spectrum to be seen. Mm -hmm. And as, a, as, a, as an audience or someone who's interested, you're gonna find things that you're disgusted by and things that inspire you. And you shouldn't run from the things that you're disgusted by, you should be aware of them and interrogate them and deconstruct them, but don't ignore them. Mazi, thank you. Friends, we are going to go to intermission now, but before uh, we let you out of this room, um, we want to give you a little bit of a hint of what you're going to experience when you come back from intermission. Um, 
Honey is going to sit down with Kareem Wasfi. And for those of you who are not familiar with Kareem and his story, we'd like to show you this short video. within art exhibit up in the atrium, but you will also, um, and this is impromptu, be hearing some music from Kareem. The spirit has so moved him. So he's going to play out in our great hall and the sound of his music is going to be echoing throughout the space. So please enjoy intermission, the Peace Within art exhibit and Kareem's music, and we'll see you back here in 20 minutes. back everyone I, I do have a question for you up to now and what you were just listening to and also in the intermission and with all the engagement and activity and how do you feel Great. what <laughs> I didn't hear that you would need a mic anybody has something to say go ahead engage Hopeful. Perfect. Anybody else? Inspired. Inspired. Any other feelings? Emotions? We're emotional human beings. Mellow. Mellow. That's interesting. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I think this model of, of joining together uh, disparate groups uh, into a common uh, orchestra or whatever could be applied in like a hundred different situations. I mean, even South Sudan, for goodness sakes. Talk about a perfect forum. And this should almost be de rigueur standard. Um, so, gosh, you know, let's spread that baby as far and wide as we can. <laughs> Thank you. So with the, all the inspiration and, and hope and even mellowness and anything that you are feeling right now, we're, we're very grateful that you're here and that you spent all this time. Um, we're gearing towards the end, but not yet. I have the honor to be speaking with Keri Mosfi. Please, if you can come on stage, you're welcome. <laughs> we get center seats today. So, it's working. Karim, how are you feeling? Good. Good? Positive, as usual. Okay. And connected to everyone, connected to every form of energy that we're sensing um, within time and space. You are a very brave and courageous person. And my first question to you is, what made you go to a bomb site? What, what is that that came into your mind and said, I'm going to take my shallow and go to a bomb site. Equilibrium um, and preserving the momentum, I think, uh, and proactive approach towards uh, uh, transcending beyond our limitations within time and space again. So it was um, um, a decision to overcome the obstacles of uh, instability, overcome the ugliness of death and intimidation through beauty and turning um, life into a theater of beauty and creativity um, when it is doable. And the people, what was their reaction at that point? 
But did you go I, thinking you know you expected a reaction, or you just I, said I was just going? I was already a public figure by by being the conductor since uh, also at a very peak of instability in 2006 in Iraq and Baghdad when everybody was literally leaving the country. I'm one of the very few who decided to stay and remain in Baghdad and to increase the number of the uh, musicians of the National Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. by intensive training, exactly doing the opposite against terror, intimidation, and ethnic cleansing and the religious problems that we had in 2005, 2006. And also through being proactive um, as a conductor. So that, that was already known through then. But, th but th that particular uh, experience, when we started having a wave of violence again in Baghdad, I thought uh, life is targeted. It was the very essence of uh, existence. Beauty was targeted. Um, refinement, cultivation. In were, the midst of everything else that is. So I took it to my. You know, I, I decided to proactively act and uh, share um, um, uh, um, uh, the concepts of, of the elements of, of, of life uh, to include music uh, uh, everywhere that is doable and everywhere that is uh, possible, and even where it was impossible, we did. And to include what they have just done uh, two months ago, um, you um, were, you for the last were, You two just months. came from I Baghdad. just came from West Mosul, not from, from what, Baghdad. Okay. I was in Mosul. We, oh, wow. we had few motors. It was very uh, rhythmic, actually, ironically. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, But uh, this was uh, not only as a challenge against terror, it was in support of um, Civility and was in support of empowering self-realization, self-conceptualization mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. to be against uh, terror by sharing beauty with them. You said you're okay. So you're in Musul. How are you doing that? What is? Are, are you recruiting musicians? Are you? Um, the it's not the recruitment yet. I mean, others are recruiting others for other reasons still. But uh, but, but you the, have the, recruited the, yes. over hundreds of uh, um, Iraqi youth. To Up become to musicians, seven hundred, uh, seven hundred twenty-three so far. Uh, in, in, instead of just my peace through arts initiative that I have started, um, initiated in, in uh, two thousand seven, mm -hmm. um, and had a great collaboration with the Department of State for one year, and managed to sustain it until now, actually on personal, um, Good for you. Uh, <laughs> with Good no for you. grants or anything, but in you know in an approach towards uh, creating a strategy for sustainment and for uh, longevity of good doing and positive impact on things. Where we, what we have reached now is de-radicalization, prevention of terror, prevention of tension, and mutual understanding, reconciliation, um, uh, uh, integration, women empowerment. I'm sorry, I didn't, this was actually this is in the first, uh, the beginning of my list, at the top of my list. You don't need to apologize. Um, <laughs> because no, it went, it went. Uh, so uh, there is so much that is done, uh, and the use of media. Uh, in relevance to uh, what we're uh, trying to um, emphasize uh, now, is the fact I, I agree with every uh, everything that we have heard so far, and we will hear um, soon still. after. Still, yes. is very positive and very functioning and very uh, uh, productive. The difference, I think, in my case, was a step towards. The decision makers, the problems between people are being addressed and being recognized and being solved through connectivity and interdependence. We need to solve problems with the decision makers. If an Israeli and Palestinian playing music together, this is great. But for the politicians of Israel or Palestine or Iraq or America or whichever are still in disagreement, to what extent the so populace is going to actually serve the purpose of So how that. do you we managed maybe not remove the gap but um, decrease yes. and also uh, to turn um, and this had, is actually achieved and is tangible to turn um, the aspects again of the elements of, of beauty, you know arts and culture connecting neurology cognitive psychology Mm -hmm. to creation, to sound and music, and arts and ther therapy as well, uh, through, through arts and drama, connecting all these the multifaceted uh, 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 operations. Uh, m we managed to um, influence even the government 
decision give making. Give a story or give us a story like of something that has happened. Well, recently I uh, performed in Ramadi for the first time uh, ever when live music was there and uh, the, we managed uh, a music school in Ramadi where until seven or eight months ago the only thing these kids or people knew were, were ISIS or Takbir or um, some ethnic tension between Sunnis and Shi'is. Mm -hmm. So we're creating trust. It's about trust. What I'm achieving or want to achieve through the media is to create proactive action by the populace, by the exposure, and then building mutual trust to enable everyone to include decision makers to reconsider actions and decisions if they actually uh, destabilize peace, mm -hmm. if it destabilizes uh, sustainability of normalcy and normality for people to experience. Um, so, um, very, very, very swiftly and quickly, the, the, the Ambar governorate is willing to give us space for the orphanage, this, uh, uh, the, the music school uh, that uh, uh, we're starting in Ambar, for instance. Okay. In Baghdad is the same, and Mosul is the same. So, arts and music, they became a sort of a patriotic approach towards civility, towards uh, perseverance, dedication, determination, to life versus being intimidated by death and by terror. And you amplify that with the use of new media. Precisely, and um, interaction. So the, the idea, what I'm promoting also, is not limited to entertainment per se, yeah, for music, but it's, it's actually including, um, encouraging the, uh, the, the people who are interacting through the media to May, you know, to take uh, to 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 state uh, a position on uh, what they um, are against or with or uh, in agreeing uh, agreeing with. Uh, we've created debate centers. Um, we've created as, as peace through arts also um, instead of a couple of centers. There are around nine centers in in, in Baghdad now. Soon there will be. I'm hoping. I mean, uh, in discussions to to adopt a whole uh, rehabilitation. Um, efforts for Amba, Mosul, Diyala, and Saladin, so that's one third of Iraq, basically. You, you're even working more. with the government to be able to do that? Not yet. Open, okay, not, not yet. But yes, there is an acceptance by the government, and I think that by itself, when I was in Mosul, and this is all personal initiative, I'm not sponsored by anyone, or this is all uh, people to people kind of uh, a genuine approach. Uh, the uh, it was actually uh, in favor of um, it was in favor of the mil military operations that are uh, ongoing, uh, supported partially by uh, the U.S. advisors and also uh, uh, mainly conducted by the counterterrorism forces in Mosul. Uh, they welcomed what I'm doing uh, as, as uh, 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 more than uh, the, 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 the need for weapons that they had because uh, when I performed in Mosul three days ago, um, um, uh, th this was a very direct message that uh, civility can win mm -hmm. and should win. And this is not about me. The, the, the fact is how can I encourage others, inspire and share hope and inspiration for the international community as well. Mm -hmm. At the core of the online course, we, we and as you saw in the in the templates as well, creativity and storytelling, and we see story narrative messaging, and the strategic uses of these creative tools. If we were to imply that on on the work that you are doing, and we talked about the creativity, and, and now you were talking about the the messaging that you want to put through, and I've I, I asked this also to Aaron and on how important the strategic use of all this is and. If you can give me an example again of um, of what you are doing that has succeeded, the and um, a case, <coughs> the use and the implementation of soft powers with an influence on decision making again. I mean, I, I have I have felt this when I was back at IU Bloomington in 1998. Four days bombardment on Baghdad. I felt it in 91 like you when I had to leave after the Kuwait situation, go back to Cairo um, and, and uh, living there, the, the, uh, you know, the impact of, of the Kuwait situation. In 98, I'm working on my master's in, in, at, over at Bloomington and I, I realized that the real problem is between a couple of governments and maybe with the, between the Iraqi government and the whole international community, whatever it was, people to people who were connected did not necessarily, uh, first of all, they didn't have an impact on the decision-making in their countries, 
which is very sad. Second, and th those are democratic countries. And secondly, th they were normal people. I mean, I, I had colleagues from all over the, the, the world. And, and the real problem was a bombardment on Baghdad for four days uh, that cost well, the, the, the US uh, uh, more than $500 million for nothing. So basically, I realized then, after 91 and then in 98, that th there, there must be a mechanism or a strategy in which it's connected to the decision-making process to get some kind of uh, an, an, an equalized, stable kind of operation mm -hmm. to enable communities, countries, different cultures to integrate and then sustain, you know, um, uh, sustain uh, uh, mutual relations based upon uh, development and mutual respect and recognition of different cultures. And the example in, in Iraq, very briefly, uh, was the fact that, um, as I mentioned, government, uh, uh, some of the, the government decisions and, and regulations that are in relation to how to function within uh, areas of conflict were changing and adopting soft powers like music, poetry, drama therapy, uh, theater, and all that in support of operations, but also in support of uh, normal, normalcy, normalcy or normality meaning people would not necessarily limit their needs uh, to food and blankets, but yes. art became a basic, important, basic need even for the refugees. And I think this is a great cultural de uh, uh, development because until recently, our music comes next somehow. We, we, you know, you need food, good, you pay taxes, you get good, good stuff, and then if you manage, you, you, can, you get uh, to an opera house. Therefore, I was turning every part of Iraq into an opera house, every street into a theater, every community center into a center of creativity and interaction. When things are normal and we have an opera house, I'll be conducting there. But uh, when things are abnormal, we have a bigger responsibility and obligation as artists, as uh, intellectuals, the whole intelligentsia scene to be uh, uh, in support of um, uh, beyond entertainment, to add to that civility, refinement, cultivation, business development, mutual understanding, cultural development, cultural uh, uh, um, uh, integration, uh, reconciliation, and as an artist, I'm not necessarily uh, ignoring the impact of the excellence and the standards, the high standards of music. I'm a very demanding musician, <laughs> yeah. but so I'm not using that without. So it's it's it, you know quality is still there, but for a purpose that is beyond um, entertainment. So I'm just going to go back again to the um, hundreds that you have been able to recruit. What is the strategy behind that? How are you able to do this? And when you say I've heard you say recruiting musicians, I'm sorry, that was my mic. <laughs> But go ahead. Um, sharing the creativity, sharing the uh, um, the understanding and enlightenment, and I was I was not I was limiting the age at some point uh, in early in, in 2005 2006 what age are we talking? through through high school okay. and through college. Okay. But um, and then I ended up including the whole populace. So there's no limit. I had a 90 year old um, a retired minister and I had an um, 11 years old uh, little beautiful girl playing the violin, and in between. Um, so uh, the idea was exposure. You can have a better understanding of the French culture, the American culture, the Swiss culture with all the different uh, cultures within, um, European, Far East, whatever, through music and through, uh, uh, through uh, music and then uh, poetry and language. But music first as a an universal and as a, um, uh, uh, a global uh, language. Um, so uh, exposure, and then uh, the impact scientifically uh, on uh, considering neurology and cognitive psychology, the impact on uh, our function, uh, self-esteem, self-confidence, empowering, uh, self-recognition, self-realization, self-conceptualization, uh, 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 resolving uh, disagreements uh, in certain ways. So it was more of a, uh, of a lifestyle that I was trying to share with the with 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 the um, with the population, with without imposing anything. I didn't uh, force anyone to like Mahler or to dislike uh, Brahms. It was, uh, it was all sorts of music were connected. And then I um, uh, expanded the genres to include Sufi oh. recently to 
uh, counter or to overcome the impact of extremism. So I, I have more than 30 you were mentioning earlier, is that new 30 have created another group of uh, now uh, up to 30 uh, young performers who are performing Sufi in English and in Arabic. And as a, as a, as a genre, as, as a, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily relating music, uh, language into this, um, uh, the impact of, of sound, <coughs> they're even performing with, uh, without words. Okay. So, um, nonverbal. Nonverbal. So as a genre, it's all included. So they're performing classical, Sufi, um, and, and other genres of music uh, based upon also the power of improvisations. So the strategy is to self-realization, as my colleagues are doing. How, what is it within us that we recognize and how we can utilize that towards developing life, whether we are running a state or we are running a bakery. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the same concept. To de-radicalize, to prevent tension, we have to act proactively and arts and culture, they come as important as weapons. It's the psychology that has been, had been used and will always be used. It's the psychology to prevent worse stories to occur. Or an um, alternative. Or an alter I wouldn't call it an alternative. What I, would you call it? Um, the, the, the impact of um, civility, you mean? No, as an alternative narrative for oh. youth out there who could be radicalized. Uh, who could be radicalized, yes. I mean, they, they, if the argument is, I'm right, you're wrong, they will answer me, we are right and you're wrong. So it's yeah. differently I'm giving. The idea is for de-radicalization is to prevent the concept of killing others uh, based upon disagreement. You can disagree for the rest of your life, but you don't have to kill and conquer uh, you know, uh, people. And uh, in some cases, I had actually, I have to share this, I, I, I had the opportunity with, with lots of officers, with one of the uh, detainees who was there. Um, I had a, a public uh, debate, I had, I had uh, passed, I don't know if it had reached uh, some of the fighters, and they said, give me, uh, you know, 10 or 14 ISIS fighters for two or three weeks, and then we can check the results, if they will still be radicalized or they'll be playing music. Because and? I had an experience <laughs> with militia fighters in Baghdad in 2006, and they ended up uh, playing flute and violin, and they're still around performing. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> and they don't feel bad about it, they feel actually encouraged to sustain life. Um, uh, so, uh, so the, uh, the, the argument uh, w was, uh, oh, many nations, to include Europe, to include the West, they conquered land and they created countries through the use of force and through extreme use of force. And, uh, and therefore, this, therefore, so this was becoming a bit of a, uh, you know, a platonic uh, discussion that is that didn't make any sense. Uh, I discussed scientifically and uh, also culturally uh, how short term um, and what a loss uh, for people to consider how uh, terror is functioning because it's a very short term impact. The long term impact is culture, is civilization is uh, uh, science, is philosophy, is the enlightenment and so forth. The short term is the use of force to kill others, but um, the long term commitment is definitely civility. Kareem Mosfi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the impromptu. <laughs> I certainly yeah. love that. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got to <laughs> well, thank you, um, Kareem, again. Um, I echo um, Honey's thanks for your impromptu concert as well. One thing that was mentioned at the beginning of our event, Dominic mentioned it, Honey mentioned it as well, this online course, Media and Arts for Peace, was uh, a product that was two years in the making. And thanks in large part to uh, Honey's network of artists and practitioners, and creatives, we actually ended up interviewing over 25 different people from around the world, artists, activists, creatives, practitioners, to be featured in this course to tell their stories of integrating media and arts into peace building. We are lucky enough to have five of those individuals um, who are featured in the course with us here today to engage in a conversation with all of you. 
So over the last uh, couple hours, Honey and I have interviewed and people have been interviewed. Now you all will be the interviewers and uh, there may be some portions where you are interviewed, where you share your own stories. So I'm gonna um, ask each of these individuals to come up one at a time, make your way over here and grab yourself a talking piece, AKA a microphone. Make your way on up here and we'll start filling in these um, seats. So the first person I'd like to welcome up to the stage is Ambassador Cynthia Schneider. She is a distinguished professor of diplomacy at Georgetown University, and she has multiple TED Talks looking at the role of culture in peace building, countering violent extremism, and there are many other um, culture-related um, projects that are part of her work, so thank you. Yes, all the way at the end. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. James Gordon up to the stage. He is the founder and executive director of the Center for Mind Body Medicine. You can visit their website at cmbm.org. He's been featured on 60 Minutes and does amazing work all over the world. So thank you, Dr. Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Come have a seat. Next, I'd like to welcome Nada Alwadi up to the stage. She is a Bahraini independent journalist and recipient of the James Lawson Award for the Practice and Study of Nonviolent Action. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lisa Shirk. She is the Director of Human Security at the Alliance for Peacebuilding and a professor at Eastern Mennonite University and the author of many books. One I will recommend is Ritual and Symbol in Peacebuilding, very much related to everything we've been talking about today. Thank you. <laughs> and then last, I'd like to welcome Catherine Wood, who is a senior arts advisor here at USIP, and her publication is uh, uh, made available to you upside at, uh, upstairs at registration. So Catherine, thank you for being part of this conversation. <laughs> and you'll notice we have three seats that will remain empty for the time being. We're going to engage in a lively conversation and discussion with our guest speakers for a little bit, and then we're gonna invite our artists and performers, Mazi, Kareem, and Aaron, back up on stage to um, uh, join the conversation as well. Honey and I will then be back in the audience with all of you. We'll be on either side of you on the staircases here, uh, facilitating the conversation, but also asking you all to raise your own questions, tell your own stories, and uh, your stories actually may act as the primer for some of the conversations that we have today. Um, nothing is out of bounds, nothing is off limits. Um, we want this to be lively and engaging. So I will start with the first question as I make my way over to the stairs here. Um, I think one of the most important questions that we want to get out there and explore this afternoon is around skepticism. And the larger question is why media and arts for peace? Why do we even spend time putting this course together, bringing these artists and creatives and practitioners here today to talk about their work? And I want you to think about an organization that is working in a conflict affected community, doing peace building work, um, countering violent extremism work, you name it, and they're thinking about perhaps integrating some media or some arts component into their work, but they're skeptical and they don't even know if it's worth it or if it has any value. What do you say to that person? What do you say to that individual around that question of why media and arts for peace? Which one of you would like to start us off with that one? Ambassador Cynthia Steiner, please. Me? No, you. <laughs> um, I, got, I can take this from a positive and um, from a negative. First of all, peace is about connecting people and increasing understanding. And on the positive side, I'd love to use an example with Mohammed Mugrabi, who I was so happy to see here. I want you all to picture this. I want you to picture the lobby of the Ritz Hotel in Doha. If you haven't been there, just picture a fancy hotel with Mohammed freestyling with an Iranian rapper, Yaz, uh, that is being captured on Second Life. This is dating me. This used to be an online platform that people could join all over the world and watch and ask questions. And that this is all being observed 
by the leaders of the Brookings Institution here in Washington and the Qatari government, because this is taking place in the context of the US Islamic World Forum. So that addresses a number of different things. One, how do you reach people? I so agree with Kareem when he was saying this. You've got to reach the decision makers. And Brookings, for a number of years, hosted groups of arts and cultural leaders that I was privileged to organize. But I wanted to find the connecting points. And hip hop is such an important connecting point, as we heard within communities, but also around the world. You know, it's like jazz. It started here, It's a, but it's about dissent. It's about questioning authority. It's about finding your place in society. And that is a, a kind of gift that we have given to the world, and then the world takes it and takes it in their own context. And it's no big surprise that hip hop is huge in Palestine and all over the Middle East and places where there is strife and conflict and we, where people are fighting authority. And that's such an important connection, not a connection to be leveraged by sending American hip hop artists there, I think, but rather by supporting the local uh, voices there and enabling them to rap and sing and perform before their own audiences. On the negative side, how do you get people to take this seriously? I ask a simple question. Extremists get why culture matters. Why don't we? Why is it that when extremists, whether it's Pol Pot, whether it's Hitler, whether it's the people who engaged the Al Qaeda linked extremists who invaded Timbuktu, why is it, or ISIS, of course, with Palmyra and Syria, why is it that they go after culture? There's a lot they could do. They could just hold people at gunpoint. No, they understand that culture is the foundation of identity. And horrifyingly enough, they understand exactly what it is in what place. So in Timbuktu, they ban music. That's why the little clip you saw, Fadi Matawala Dumar, a, a Malian singer, said, what, they want to ban music? They have to kill me first. That's how important music is. It is the lifeblood of society there. It's how people talk about the past, the present, and the future. And so when this group comes in and wants to dominate, they strip away that foundation. So my question is, why, when our government spends I mean, who knows how much money, you know, well, we do know, unfortunately, how much money um, trying to kill people. Why don't we recognize that if we want to rebuild, if we want to instill resistance, we have to give people, help them to reclaim the foundation of their identity, what makes them click, what connects them, what enables them to envision and build a future. And that is arts and culture. Catherine. Um, one thing which I think has been underlying all of the discussions so far today hinges around a word that I haven't heard yet, and that word is humanization. I think that's been implicit in the entire afternoon's discussion. And um, the arts are definitely a way of bringing a human dimension to a conflict which very often those of us who work in the traditional conflict resolution field don't think about often enough from my perspective. Um, the, what I would say to answer Darren's question is that by, bringing, by incorporating arts and culture into our peace building work, we're bringing in a very strong human dimension uh, where we can begin to understand the worldview of, quote, the other. We had a marvelous example earlier this afternoon of um, uh, youth from Israel and from Palestine making music together and the bridges that that created and the way that it was able to foster some very sensitive and difficult dialogues, but they could do it at a human level. Um, so what I would tell in this, in this hypothetical situation is that's, that's one advantage is the humanization for the parties who might be in conf conflict with each other. In addition, I would point out, and I'll let, let Dr. Gar Gordon say more about this, I would point out the, um, some of the neuroscientific research that's being done now, which suggests, as, as Nancy said in her introductory remarks, people are not entirely rational beings. And 
very often conflict specialists tend to analyze conflicts uh, strictly in terms of a traditional reactor, rational actor model in international relations. And we like to look at things through a political lens and through an economic lens and through a security lens. And these things are terribly important, but human beings are not strictly homo politicus. Uh, we are everything. We are psychological beings, we're spiritual beings, we're ethical beings, we are uh, emotional beings, we are rational beings sometimes. We are all of these things. And in terms of looking at the human dimension of conflict, we really can get a more comprehensive view of what the problem is and potentially what the solutions are. So I think by bringing in the arts and culture, it really fosters a much more holistic approach to our work. Thank you. Yeah. We, uh, Okay, um, so I'm a journalist, so I would like to kind of incorporate the media aspect here. Um, I think uh, media is a very important ally for anybody who wants to spread a message of peace anywhere. And this is something that um, peace builders, uh, nonviolent strategists uh, really need to realize. And media is, is a very fluid concept, like any, uh, the media is a channel that kind of uh, uh, connects you to the rest of the world, that people will actually know your message when you understand media and when you reach the media. Which is why, I mean, back to your question, Darren, uh, do we, as people who are involved in peace building, do, you, do we need media? I would say definitely yes. And I think uh, media, I mean, when you in, get involved in media, you need to be as creative as possible to uh, attract the media to cover your story. And that's important. For example, when I was watching uh, uh, Mr. Wasfi's performance in that scene, that was an amazing act that is will never be ignored by media. And that, I think, is, is, and in itself was uh, such an, I think, an amazing tool to um, change minds, change um, behavior even. And, and I totally agree. It actually can reach a point where it can change behavior. Just an act of, of uh, that particular uh, act of playing music in that spot and then being carried out by media that even if people didn't see it on that spot, they would see it through media and it will continue being spread. That's something that is very important I think and again I, I just can't stress on how important to have the media as an ally to anybody who wants to spread a message who, who want and and it's it, it basically comes with with a big challenge which is understanding media media is changing every day I mean we can see it as media professionals media is now new it uses a new technology social media is very spreading everywhere and, and all these tools are very important and in, and also I mean social media for example if I want to talk about it social media is a free tool for everybody it's a free tool for radicalized people also and it's a free tool for uh, peace builders and it's a very, very challenging world out there. Like, I am somebody who um, b is, believes in social media, who believes that we need these tools because we need the free sphere. We need the, the space for, uh, in, in places where media is controlled, the messages can't reach people. We need a free media. We need the tool for those people who want to spread their messages. But also, it brings a big challenge, which is um, we don't have a social media war right now going on. I mean, because the, the tool is free and it's available for everyone, so it, it makes it harder, I think, for peace builders to keep up, to be um, like uh, updated, to know how to use these tools, because uh, everybody can use it. Oppressive regimes can use it. Radical people can use it to spread their ideologies. It's really challenging. So. Media is an important ally, but it's very challenging. But we, there is no way. I mean, I see, I saw many activists who say, you know what, uh, media doesn't understand us. They, they don't want to cover our story, so we shouldn't really bother. I don't agree with that. I think it's an ally that you don't want to lose. You just need to understand and keep up with the media game. I would say. Lisa and then Jim, um, I want to hear you both respond to this and then we're going to turn it to the audience, but Lisa, right. I, I wanted to link back to the neuroscience of this so that our brains um, are, are emotional and are rational and the frontal cortex deals well with words. 
but images and emotions and senses and stimulation basically often comes through the arts and the media. Uh, Nadine Block is here in the audience and she's the queen of nonviolent activism in terms of using the arts to really uh, infuse a movement with creativity and, and the audience for the movement. So those passers-by watching a protest, how do you engage with them? How do you communicate with them? Uh, do you just hold a plaque that has all the words of what your movement is about? Or do you create symbols and ways of pulling people in? Um, because I think it's really important to understand that our brain, we get on neural pathways and, and often in conflict we just go around and around in the same thought pattern. And what the arts and the media and a, and a beautiful piece of cello music or a rap piece that we heard this morning, it just shakes us up. We start chanting different words and we practice things with a rhythm and it, it gets our brains actually thinking in new patterns. And that's really, I think, what it comes down to. The rational argument for the arts and the culture is our brains need to be shaken up in terms of how we think about conflict and how we break through. It's, it's really good to listen to all of you, and, I, and I have a, I'm starting to have more of a sense of how I fit in here. It's good. <laughs> I, I think uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I work during wars and after wars and in situations of great conflict. And the, the way we approach the work we do, I think we both use creativity and work with the media. But I want to circle back a little bit because we begin with people who are in a state of either agitation and chaos or else they're frozen and shut down physically, psychologically, spiritually, the imagination is not functioning. That's, that's what happens when people are traumatized. That's what happens to any of us when we're traumatized. So the first piece that we do is we uh, are always saying to people, not only we're saying that change is possible, we're giving them an experience from the beginning. And so we begin with two things. One is simply teaching people to breathe deeply and slowly and to balance the nervous system, to balance the fight or flight response of the sympathetic nervous system with the relaxation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And while we do that, we explain the idea is that everybody is far more intelligent often than we give them credit for, or more importantly, than they give themselves credit for. So we're always teaching uh, each step that we take, we're teaching them, for example, the physiology. So people are quiet, and they notice that change is possible. So if we were to do this for five minutes, 80 to 90% of the people in this room, or in fact, 80 to 90% of people, even in the middle of shelling and a war, would notice a change in their nervous system and they'd be a little quieter, a little more focused. And so what that says, in a way that words can't, is that change is possible, that hope is possible, and that each person can make a difference. And if you're one of the 20% who didn't, well, your neighbor's not that much smarter or more ingenious than you are, and you'll be likely to do it later on. So once that happens, then creativity is possible. And we work a lot with drawings and uh, as, a, as a way of people discovering who they are. So we do very simple sets. You can look on our website. A lot of this stuff is available. Uh, some of it is in the media, which I'll come to later on. But we give people an opportunity to draw themselves and draw yourself with your biggest problem and then draw yourself with your problem solved. Uh, so it gets everybody out of that frantic left brain that isn't working so well anyway, begins to make connections with the imaginative, and I'm oversimplifying, with the imaginative right side of the brain, and gets people out of their self-consciousness a little bit. They have kind of become like kids, again, doing the drawings. Drawing your biggest problem, you identify something. People will say, I have so many problems. I've lost my home, I don't have a place to stay, I don't have a job, whatever, just let it come out. And that's important as well. And then the third piece is to imagine the problem is solved. And what's quite amazing is that the rational mind has been totally unable to solve the problem in any way. And yet, in the drawings, bringing in creativity, something comes up. 
some solution, 90, 95% of the drawings. It's not always pleasant, but it's a reality. And so once again, the imagination provides the, um, you know, the, the guidance for what might be possible. Now, as coming to, uh, and it, the, the Darren mentioned the 60 Minutes show, which, you, it's a, which really features the drawings of a nine-year-old girl in Gaza who lost her father. And you see in the change in her drawings from the first mind-to-body group where she's sharing what's going on and where the solution to her problem is to die and be with her father, to become a shaheed, to become a martyr in some way. Uh, and then you see in the ninth drawing, after using a number of different creative techniques and after having a sense of quiet and recovering a sense of self and a sense of her potential role in the culture, she's drawing herself as a doctor and in fact as a heart doctor. So her heart has been broken by her father's death, learning approaches and techniques for quieting her nervous system, for using her imagination, for being able to contemplate a future has given her the sense that she can use her own pain and her own suffering to, um, to help other people whose hearts have been hurt by war or in whatever way they've been hurt. So it's, it's a beautiful example of, of what's possible and of art being both a means of expression and also a, a way to record what happens and the change that happens. And the other thing that, that I think is really important is when it comes to media is from the beginning, uh, it's been Im important to us whenever possible to bring the work that we do into the larger, in into the media. And people who watch this, 15 million people watch this on 60 Minutes, their, their hearts were touched by seeing this little girl. And so there is a sense that in this place that everybody really does their best to ignore, which is Gaza, or demonize in some way, that there's, that there's not only humanity, but that there's a possibility for change and for hope. So the media is important in many ways to bring messages that have been buried by conventional thinking or by you know, political maneuvering to bring those out again. So let me stop with that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the audience, and then, and of course, if you have any comments and questions as well, how many, or if somebody would take this mic from me and tell me, when is the time that you felt, no way, I'm not changing my mind, it's not happening, nobody can shape my behavior or attitude, it is what it is. Or you were able to actually rewire or change, and if that did happen, what did it take? Were you persuaded, were you manipulated, or were you coerced into change? Who would like to, over there. Name. My name is Judy. Um, so I guess my example is that I said I would never, ever, ever live in DC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, years later, I have a 202 number <laughs> and address um, that I said I wouldn't after I graduated college, not because I had anything against the city, but um, for personal reasons. Um, after college, I wanted to be farther, farther away from my family, and I had a couple, just a couple family members who lived in D.C., and I was like, no, I don't want you sending me on errands and calling me to go and do this and do that. So I was like, I'm not going to be here. And someone suggested it while I was here working for the summer during college, and I, with like the most haughty, haughty attitude, I just threw my head back and I laughed. I was like, <laughs> you're cute. Go sit down. And... Um, I ended up coming here, and what changed my mind was the situation that I was in. I wanted to live in Chicago, where I used to live. I wanted to stay in Atlanta, where I was living at the time. And I think God just maneuvered it, because I applied for so many jobs after college, and I didn't get anything. And so I was like, OK, I'm going to live in DC with my sister. And um, almost seven years later, I absolutely love it. Love it. So yeah. Seven years, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just one more person. Okay. 
Darren, do you have a story? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I always Darren have a story. always has a story. Won't share it right but, now. <laughs> that's, that's true. Um, I just wanted to take it back in regards to manipulation, coercion, and, and persuasion, and what the difference is when somebody's persuaded to change their mind, manipulated to change their mind, or coerced to change their mind. What is the outcome of any of these three? I can think of um, actually a, a persuasion example uh, that involves hip hop actually, and it's kind of an example of what I was talking about of leveraging local voices. I recommend to everyone, there's a wonderful film that's based on a project called I Love Hip Hop in Morocco, project of a, a young um, American who went on a program, sadly doesn't exist anymore, an MTV Fulbright to go study or do something with music in another part of the world. And he went to study hip hop in Morocco and he quickly figured out that what they wanted most was to be able to perform before their own audiences. There were all these talented musicians and they just didn't have the funding and the organizational capacity to put on concerts. So this 23, 24 year old guy helped them. He could get into the American consulate. There's a whole story about how they got it going. But anyway, they got three concerts arranged in three cities and um, some of the rappers were female. And so the, and the audience was like 99% male. I would add that the title, I Love Hip Hop in Morocco, came from the Moroccans. This was not a, U so there are two levels of persuasion here. This was not a US public diplomacy strategic communications because the US presence was helping them put on these concerts, which was what they wanted to do. They said, I love hip hop in Morocco. They, and people were waving American flags. Nobody passed them out. Nobody asked them to do that. But they appreciated it. So the female rapper comes out, and the audience starts to boo. These are 10,000 people in each of these three concerts. 10,000 men start booing this young woman. And she just says, hey, you know, give me a chance. I'm here. I have something I'd like to share with you. Just give me a minute. And of course, they were all cheering her in the end. So you could have sent you know, someone like me to sit people around a table and talk to them about the importance of equality of women, or provide a platform for this young woman to persuade 10,000 men on the strength of her own music a good and herself. Lisa. Lisa. I can think of an example from South Africa where the protest movement involved song and dance um, every time, basically, people were out in the street. And it, it was coercive, really, more than persuasive. I think we tend to think of the arts and culture as persuasive. But when the South African police would come with their big weapons and be um, overcome by the sh singing and the dancing and the pervasive spirit of the song, um, you know, it was a force more powerful. It was a greater power when everybody is singing and dancing together in protest of oppression. I can't think of anything, you know, it's just, it communicates, you cannot keep us down. Yeah. We have a voice, we have our bodies, and we're free. And they were announcing their freedom, and it was coercive. But um, I, I think it did change the world's mind uh, by watching it, and, and many white people too, I think, in South Africa were so moved at the strength that came out of the protest movements mm -hmm. there. Thank you. I want to add something in there. What about subversive? It was just different than in terms of what's like motivating a change in behavior or attitude. But I'm interested to hear from the audience if you've ever been exposed to some form of art, I'm thinking particularly music, that was subversive for you. You were unaware of something, an issue, whether it's something around gender dynamics or a conflict going on in the world or some type of injustice, but your entree into understanding that was a piece of music or a song that all of a sudden a light bulb went off in your head or a spotlight was shed on an issue that you just didn't care about before. Does anyone in the audience have an experience like that where a piece of music or a piece of art had that subversive impact on you? Yeah. I'm Niaz Ayman from Pakistan. Uh, I live and work in Islamabad. Uh, 
So we have this tradition of literature festivals now in, in Pakistan, and we have four or five different literature festivals. Um, I've, I've been to many of them, and always I saw it's only English and one, one national language, what they call, uh, being spoken. And it turned out it, it's always uh, kind of elitist kind of narrative which is there, uh, not common men's literature there, not common people's literature there. And I realized Pakistan has actually 60 languages and about 15 to 20 languages of them are very well developed. Uh, from there, I you know, came up with this idea of uh, why not having a literature festival which is only focused on Pakistani languages. And we have been doing a, a literature festival of Pakistani mother languages now, uh, which has been running for two years. And we were able to bring 150 writers each year from these Pakistani languages together and talk about their literature, their languages, and it has become a totally non-elitist and non-kind of uh, uh, English-speaking people's literature festival and running very well. And we brought people from various parts of Pakistan to Islamabad, and some of them who were very well-established writers in their languages, but they were visiting Islamabad for, for the first time in their life, and they were talking to audience within their country for the first time in, in their life. Thank you. Thank you. So I think you touched on something interesting there. And somebody online posted a question um, that was along the lines of how do you balance the creativity that comes with um, creating art or using arts and media with the cultural context in which you're working? Um, so my question is, in the work that you've done, had there been um, elements of art or media that are universal and kind of transcend culture and language? And when have there been examples where you really had to think differently, develop a completely different strategy in using or integrating arts, given that the culture was quite different than where the idea originated? Well, I can think of something um, that we did at uh, Georgetown through the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics when we hosted a production from Pakistan, which is called Arinka Chalo, which was a satire on US-Pakistan relations that took place in a visa office, in a consular office, and made equal fun of both the Americans, who I got to play the ambassador, and we did all sorts of ridiculous things like arm wrestling to get a visa, and also of the Pakistanis who, you know, wanted to give away, in the end were invaded by terrorists and, and they all really just want a visa to go to America. So there were a lot of jokes along the way. But along the way, there were also some jokes that our Pakistani colleagues thought were hysterical and we said, no, no, you can't possibly do that here. Um, and you know, it had to do with racism and all, and I don't think there were things that were necessarily malicious, but we found at, you know, at one point I thought, oh God, we really can't put this on because the sense of humor was so different and the satire was so different. Um, but we did, you know, we figured out a way to do it and I think in a way the biggest revelation to Washington when you think about shattering stereotypes was, oh my gosh, Pakistanis have a sense of humor. Well. Go, go ahead, I'll, I'll. That's a great question, and it's a really complicated issue. Um, I just would like to share a few preliminary thoughts about it. First of all, everything has to happen in a place of some kind, whether it's cyberspace or whether it's physical space in a particular country and in a particular community. And local context is always terribly important, so that has to be taken into, into account and given great weight. Um, but I do think that there's a difference between art forms that involve language and those that do not. Uh, for example, poetry or literature on the one hand, even theater where it's spoken theater. Um, that has certain constraints around it um, that might not exist so much in say visual art um, or in certain forms of music, particularly music where there are no words, instrumental music. Um, and I'm trained as a, as a classical musician myself, so I'm really, really interested in, in musical art forms. And I've been doing just a little bit of reading on some of this. And um, 
some of the neuroscience research now around music is really fascinating, and they point out that the very first thing that we ever hear, the first sound we are exposed to is before birth, and that's your mother's heartbeat. So there's something about rhythm and the heartbeat and that particular sound, which is intrinsic in every human being and really transcends culture. Um, and you can go on from there and talk about melody and sound waves and, and all of that. Obviously, you have different musical forms, and the classical music of India is not the same as the classical music of uh, Great Britain, for example. But there are uh, boundaries that can be crossed, and I think the question itself is getting at one of the paramount questions in all of this, which is what is particular and what is universal in the human experience when it comes to art? Yeah. So let, let me reflect on this a little bit. First of all, I think one thing we haven't perhaps emphasized as much as we should is the enormous power of people coming together small groups, large groups, uh, the, the, the major, the, the most important, quote, intervention, close quote, for people who are traumatized is having other people there. Because when your nervous system is shut down the way it is in trauma, even though you know everybody else in your neighborhood may have suffered the same way, you know it intellectually, you don't feel it. You feel incredibly isolated. So coming together and using the arts to bring people together is absolutely vital. Second thing is that, it, the, the, that we are um, so much more like each other than we are different. So we use music, art, verbal expression, moving the body in every culture. We have the, basically the same approach, whether it's former child soldiers in Mozambique or, uh, or Israeli soldiers or U.S. veterans or uh, Kosovo refugees, wherever we are, it's essentially the same approach. Now, there are some times when people have some particular um, you know, there are particular uh, ex kinds of expression that they prefer. And so uh, you just have to give them an opportunity to tell you what they are. We do our best to, to figure out what's most appropriate in terms of the music we use and the kinds of movement that we encourage. And just one very quick story. When we were in Haiti, not long after the earthquake, we were dealing, uh, working with the girls in the nursing school. They were 18, 19 years old. And 90, 90 of the nursing students had been killed in the earthquake. And so we were doing a day-long workshop, and we were using, doing some work with the imagination and breathing and drawings. And then toward the end of the afternoon, I got everybody up shaking and dancing. And in the shaking, if you move, start moving your body, emotions start coming up. So and all these girls, they'd lost their sisters, they'd lost their friends. So half or two-thirds of them were weeping just in the course of doing the shaking. And then the music that I put on was Bob Marley's Three Little Birds. And so the girls are crying, they're laughing, they're singing along, and, uh, and, it's, and they start saying afterwards, because we get, really need to give people a chance to express what, what the experience was like, what the experience of any creative experience, any imaginative experience. So they said, well, this is the first time we've been able to cry because we had to be strong for everybody else. We had to hold it in. So this is such a relief. And many of them said things like that. There were about, I don't know, 100, 120 of them in the, in the program we were doing. And then one girl raised her hand and she said, Jim, she said, we all love Bob. But we are Haitians, and we have very good music here in Haiti. Next time you use Haitian music, I said, OK, you got it. Give me some music to use. I'll use it next time. So I want to I wanna follow up on, on something that was said. And then I do want Nada and Lisa, I want you to pick up on this, given that your, your expertise really is in, in media. So Catherine, you said something about that creative experience, everything happens in some type of space, whether it's physical space here or cyberspace. And I want to ride the cyberspace um, train a little bit. Then you mentioned about how something that is universal is that when people are in a sense of experiencing a sense of trauma, that bringing people together and sharing physical space, I assume is what you're talking about, is one of the first key ways to address that. So we're talking about cyberspace. We're talking about people who are traumatized or marginalized and the need to come together. And then I think that opens us up to this whole question around social media that you talked about earlier, Nada. 
In the last 48 hours, a lot of the global news is around what happened in, in Manchester. And anytime there's a violent extremist attack, questions start ra uh, get raised around what influence did social media have in radicalizing this person. And I think this is a connection to this because it's a sense of community that exists in cyberspace, but oftentimes those communities are individuals who are still isolated. So yes, they come together, but maybe not physically. And so I wanna pose this statement to the audience and see how you, Nada, and Lisa react to, to the audience's um, comments on this. I'm gonna say a statement, and I want you to agree or disagree with it. If you agree with the statement, I want you to put up a fist, like, yeah, I agree with that. If you disagree with the statement, I want you to put up a palm, meaning like, no, wait a minute, I don't think that that's true. And the statement is, that violent extremist groups are more effective at using social media than are peace builders. Agree or disagree? Violent extremist groups are more effective at using social media than are peace builders. So fist if you agree, palm if you disagree. Okay, honey, can you pick somebody who agreed and someone who disagreed? Yeah. And, and, and hear what they say, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts, Lisa. I'd, I'd actually like to hear those who disagree ah. <laughs> first. <laughs> who would like to go? I'm going to start choosing. There were a couple of palms <laughs> I'm over gonna there. I'm going to be the professor <laughs> and start choosing. Annie? Well, I agreed. You agreed, but tell us why you agreed and you disagreed. Okay. Do you want to go? F whichever. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Annie Paulson. I feel that the voice that a lot of extremist groups have is more amplified than their presence, whereas I feel that the number of people in the world doing good through arts and music is so huge, but we're not connected to each other. So I, I feel that it's more about a scale issue. I don't know which voice is bigger in an overall sense, but I feel that in terms of who is best represented in the scale. It is the people working against peace. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to do say one comment. Annie Paulson is also with us on the online course. So thank you for coming from New York. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I actually don't really know the right or wrong answer, but I disagreed uh, using an example. A colleague from India told me about what has been happening in India, not to pick on one particular country. But these days we hear so much about uh, rapes in India. So as a concerned person, I asked a friend from India why is the case. It's like, oh no, the reason why we hear so much about this now is because it's easy to post these things on social media. But these same things were happening before, but because we were not really <coughs> seeing this on social media, we now feel like it's, there's so much going on, it's just because it's amplified. So my view actually also goes back to someone I saw wearing a hat which says, peace does not sell. <laughs> and I asked him why, he said, well, when you have something violent, it is easily blows up. So I think that like, you know, there are so many people trying to uh, promote peace, and they use social media, and they are there all the time, but because peace is, does not, in behavior science, does not really, sort of peculiar that kind of intrigue to try to find out what's going on. We tend not to pay attention, but people are trying to their best to actually promote this, and we just need to be able to follow it as much as follow violent crimes. Thank you. I, I, can I just pick up on, on what you said about intrigue back to all of you in regards to intrigue? Nada, you said something at the very beginning, and this is a question for everybody, of course, on how do you attract, how do you intrigue then? not only the media, but how do you create the intrigue that radicals know how to do best? Why is it that what bleeds leads still in the media? Why is it, it's breaking news all the time, and sometimes like, okay, give me real breaking news now. Um, so what would you, what would, yeah. you say to that? I would like to respond to all of that. Uh, this is such an interesting um, uh, discussion, really. Um, back to your question first, uh, honey. Um, I think, yeah, I agree. Uh, media is uh, stepping into a very violent uh, atmosphere. It has been. 
and it, it is not supposed to be like that. Uh, originally, I believe as a media professional, as somebody who believes in journalism, we are um, ambassadors of truth. We, we are uh, the eyes and minds of the public in a conflict zone or and whenever something happens. And we have a responsibility to show what is important to the public. And what the media, mainstream media at least, uh, have been doing uh, is following the blood, the uh, people dying and all of that. And at, I mean, by default, when, when somebody is dying, when there is a bomb, the, the headline will be that these people were killed. So people are now, they, they don't feel comfortable reading the news anymore. It is really always about dying and all of that. And I think, I mean, there are terminologies being introduced in the uh, journalism sphere and media sphere, peace journalism and, and um, stuff that kind of goes back to why we are reporting these news. Uh, I am somebody who believes that when I report on a conflict, I need to report on the human story behind it before actually starting with the, how many people were killed and, and the, the blood that actually happened because Humanizing of that. Humanizing the data. Exactly. The Humanizing it, telling the story and back to the storytelling. Because each violent act in itself has an uh, impact on human life and also is being driven by uh, a story. And this story is more important, I think, to the public. That's the, the public deserve to know that, not to know, okay, how many people were killed uh, in, in, in the beginning. And uh, actually, this connects me back to um, just I want to say that I think the human story is universal. I mean, by itself, when there is a child being uh, affected by war, and as a journalist, if you are there, you report it, everybody will be connected to the story. This is something that is universal. You don't need to put words or kind of furnish it. This story it speaks on itself. And, and this is something that uh, I think has been captured by media, but also because of politics and because this world is not necessarily necessarily connected, and uh, sometimes, and this is back to uh, who actually has the media and who can control the media, um, maybe the story that we need to know doesn't really need, reach us. That, I mean, even the stories that we receive every day might not necessarily be the stories that the public needs to know. And th there is a whole um, reason why, I mean, the, the whole uh, agenda setting of the media is uh, around that, that line. Social media and radicalization, the answer to your question, Darren, I think I would lean towards no. I don't think uh, necessarily uh, radicalized people are winning this war, the social media war, uh, even though I don't think uh, peace builders are winning either. I think it's a tool that is available for everyone. And even though we do have the data, at least for, like, for example, the ISIS uh, supporters and ideology uh, uh, sympathizers, we do have the data. Many reports have been uh, showing that uh, they are very well organized in terms terms of media and social media in particular, they are, it is scary. They are organized, they, they have been from early stages, they are very aware of how important media and social media is. And this is something that I think peace builders are just catching up to. It's not about that they are winning, maybe they started earlier. And I think uh, most of the, I guess, people who believe in, um, they are against hate, spreading hate speech in social media, are aware of this. There are so many things that happened in these uh, uh, past years after all these radicalization in social media. Twitter, for example, is banning anybody who's using hate speech or several words. There are so many practical actions that have been taken on uh, institutions levels, on media levels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all these kinds of people kind of allied with each other to ban some people because, okay, I am with free speech and everybody is allowed to say whatever they want, but also there are things, we, we are in a dangerous world, I believe, and hate speech is everywhere and radicalization is happening on social media, especially in the Middle East. And, and at least by, at least filtering this world, the social media sphere world, um, this might be um, a more safe, area for people actually to spread their ideas. So that's my take on this. Lisa. It's a question? Uh, no. Yes, please. Thank you. 
firstly, thank you very much for organizing this, and I'm really excited about the course. I have a question that has to do with the arts. Now, for the last 20 years, I've been a mediator and a facilitator. I work with very polarized groups. Uh, my background, though, is in the arts. It's in the visual arts, in design, as well as in creative writing. One of the things that I struggle with, and I find most people in the field, uh, I'm a practitioner, not an academic. So I work with this on a daily basis. So one of the things that I struggle with is the, ways, is the way in which art is seen and used in conflict resolution and peace building. I suspect that more people uh, than not tend to use it as a frill, as uh, a device to create comfort or at best uh, as a tool to bring up uh, emotions and create some kind of catharsis. No problem with that at all. My challenge is this. Anybody who is in the arts, if you're not just catering to uh, the commercial aspect of art, you are really crossing boundaries. You are taking huge conceptual risks. Now, more, I mean, most of the people I know in conflict resolution are terrified of taking risks, are terrified of crossing boundaries because they are so scared that something could go wrong uh, if they push the participants uh, in a workshop or in a dialogue or in a mediation beyond a point, and if that can create, uh, if that ends up creating more harm. Now, this is, a, this is a real tension. Now, if I really don't want to create harm, I will continue to do the kind of things that are fairly predictable that will hopefully create incremental change. But that's not the way an artist functions. Any good artist really pushes boundaries. And when you push boundaries, you don't quite know what is going to come at the other end of it. So when we talk about conflict resolution or peace building and the arts, I wonder how we can do that without also, at one level, celebrating risk taking. Creativity is is risk taking. Otherwise, you're replicating what already exists. You're putting a veneer or a finish on it, and uh, it's a feel good technique. So the work I do is not about spectacles. It's not about uh, performance. It's not about making people feel good, because I work with polarized groups. And the only way I can get uh, any kind of substantive shift in terms of the way they see themselves, the way they see the world or the conflict, is to get them to recognize how they see the whole world, their conceptual framework. And that, I, I think arts is an extraordinarily powerful tool, provided I push the boundaries. So I would love to hear from you folks. How do you balance this tension? Thank you. I'm Thank not you. sure I'm going to answer that question, but maybe. I think in the days after 9-11, the attacks here, um, there were a variety of responses. I would say most Americans sat by their television and watched the film over and over of the Twin Towers falling. And we know from psychologists now, the number of times you saw the Twin Towers fall on media correlates with your level of depression and your kind of despair and conservatism. The only response is to bomb them, that type of activity or that type of thought. The people who went out and gave blood and were in a social context and maybe didn't talk about their trauma, but were together, um, had a much better long-term prognosis of recovering from trauma and a more optimistic outcome in terms of thinking. So I think in Manchester, what peace builders um, don't get is that it doesn't have to always be about words. Give people a, a place to give blood. I actually think after every terror, that's just should be, open it up, have musicians play. People want to help, they want to feel like they can do something and actually being in a setting where you're physically involved, it's actually a work of art. All these people giving blood, Republicans, Democrats, together, it doesn't matter what your politics are, you have to feel like you're bodily together and involved. Um, 
And I, I think we need a ritual in this country when how to respond, how to not fall to watching our television with scenes of the bomb site over and over again. And we have to recognize that that is another form of art that is, um, is not good for our brains. Do you remember the Mozart Requiem that was played around the world on the first anniversary? People remember that? It started in New Zealand and was played continuously following the cycle of the day and night around the world and gave people a wonderful opportunity to gather without words. It was yeah. People just, just listen to it. But I think in answer to your question very briefly, uh, I think we've heard many, no one's talking about a spectacle here. And artists do take risks all the time. That's the nature of the game. And there is no balance. They just take the risks. So we're coming to the end of our time, but I want to bring um, our performers up here as well. So Kareem, uh, Aaron, and Mazi, if you could come and join us up on stage. And I had an idea about how to um, kind of go have a seat, please. How to orchestrate. Yeah, how to orchestrate <laughs> the, the end here, because I'm sensing uh, some questions emerging in the audience. And uh, if, if you're fair game for this, honey, I yes. thought we could get four or five questions from members of the audience all at once. Yes. And then actually go down the line here in kind of a quick fire response, um, you know, one minute or less. And you can choose which of those questions you want to respond to. Um, and we'll go down the line and we'll, we'll kind of keep you to one minute to each of those. So let's get five questions from members of the audience. And you all hopefully can remember what those are. And then pick one that you want to respond to and we'll, we'll go down, down the line. I think I already have a hands up right. <laughs> of right here. Your name, please. Uh, my name's uh, Lucas Olson. I'm a regent, recent graduate of American University and Wesley Theological Seminary. And my question is, kind of jumping off the last uh, comment about rituals for healing, what positive roles can religious institutions play, um, particularly in the media, trying to uh, leave conflict? Um, Peter Humphrey. Uh, there's the classic example of ping pong being used uh, to create a geopolitical change between the US and China in the 70s. Um, I wonder if any of you can think of examples, or even an example, where sort of the media and arts push has evolved into a geopolitical change on the ground. Because ultimately, I think that's the dream here. Thank you. Right here. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Jocelyn Cordell. I'm a recent graduate at the Elliott School. My question is in regards to the arts as both a form and a process. Um, speaking as a former educator and performer myself, I found with my students in encouraging not only critical thinking, but the ability to find one's identity and one's ability to feel safe especially among North, um, Northern Korean students that I encountered while I was in Korea. How would you find that it's both the process as well as the artistic form in bringing together individuals who are dealing with trauma and dealing with conflict? If you can speak to that personally in regards to your own experience, or in regards to the best way to move forward for the next generation of peace builders. Thank you. Thank you. One more? Oh, we got one up top. Yep. You want to or you don't? <laughs> Maybe you won't see me. Ah, oh, no. But hello, I'm, uh, I'm a visual artist and I graduated from American University of Communications. I um, believe that artists are uh, responsible for a time capsule just as temples did for us for thousands of years. Uh, my question is, uh, being exposed to so much negative media, and the, when are we going to cross the line and have the ethics really enforced and control Hollywood of what is being broadcasted on the media today. I, I hear neurology, I hear brains, I hear children, I hear Iraq, I hear Mosul, I hear uh, Korea, I hear India, I hear the world. Humanity is in crisis. And 
I remember reading back in the 80s when I was at AU a, a, a research that was done by the United Nations on how Africans were going to another village because they had a television to watch Bill Cosby because he represented the African-American, how this beautiful black man can live in that li type of life. Um, when are we going to set the standards and the ethics and really enforce the ethics of how visual media is being presented to the public and how are we going to be really responsible? I love all of you. I think if we all get together today, we can solve the world problems. But then we have to make it into a reality. Um, with a brush, with a camera, with music, with rap, with, uh, with an Arab, with a Jew, uh, with a Kurd and a, and a Syrian, with a Shiite and a Muslim, a Jew and a Christian and a Muslim all standing together. We all believe in humanity and we really need to save it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good question. Oh. Any other questions from the audience? Take one more. Okay, last Just question, and then we'll go down the line. So Patrick Kavand, I, I talked earlier about India. Um, um, a question I have is a question which an arts education a person sort of posed. So for example, if you are trying to promote arts education, we always try to ask artists to teach more art and try to describe how art can transform uh, students to learn other subjects. But what doesn't always occur is to ask administrators to understand how the arts actually do influence the thinking of students. So my question to the panel and maybe to others here is that all of us who believe in the arts congregate together and talk about these issues. But how are we going to present this message, for example, to the White House, where the National Endowment for the Arts has been said be, may be cut, the National Endowment for Humanities, that always what seems to be important is the Ministry of Defense, when defense is not just, or security is not just military security, there's also human security and other forms of security. So how can we get this conversation to other people to believe that the arts are also as important in peace building? as other elements and not just leave this to artists. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So we've got five great questions, a yeah. lot to chew on. In the next eight minutes, I'm gonna keep you all to one minute or less. You can pick one of those questions or if you can answer two of them, 30 seconds each, that's your prerogative. Um, I wanna take a volunteer for the person who would like to start. Cause I know probably some of you are still chewing on this. <laughs> all right, we're gonna, Kareem, we'll start with you. Uh, and. Well, um, I, I think and then we'll go down this way and then end with Mazi and, and Very Eric. briefly, uh, I, uh, in relation to GCSB, I think adopting um, an example, considering GCSB as, and what I have been exposed of the, to over there, and, and Honey knows very well, um, a, a model that actually works, addressing the problem, uh, sharing, identifying, categorizing, uh, and coming up with solutions and sharing solutions as well as sharing the problem itself. I think the media is going to be one of the ways we share and then we solve problems. We don't necessarily limit the media to exposure and to awareness and maybe, uh, um, you know, t taking, taking through the media, the first step is knowing but the actual impact should be doing after knowing and what is it uh, that we can do on the personal level uh, to resolve uh, all of what we have mentioned in terms of disagreements. Uh, do we connect based upon our differences or our similarities? That's so obvious. We, we, we are so similar, as uh, you mentioned, and, and we realize that. So I think uh, the next generation is going to, I think it's already happening with, with the youth, of the impact of connectivity um, in between different cultures and different countries. Now, ethically, I totally agree with you. It's like um, uh, artificial intelligence, who is, who, is, who is actually regulating the ethics of a robot if it functions better than me as a human being in, in probably a few years from now. Uh, who is actually setting the parameters for that? So basically, we're in, in an era 
of, uh, of, 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 of a very interesting change. I think we can use the media pro pro proactively towards uh, solving uh, lots of what we are actually uh, witnessing in terms of disagreement and with an emphasis of what works not what does not work. And this will uh, uh, lead us towards ethically how we can channel the impact of the media and, and um, you know, the, the proactive approach of, of uh, resolving uh, things. Okay, I would love to answer the first question about what religious institutions can do in this vein. Um, my entire professional life has been spent in the arts, but I did happen to attend a uni university-based divinity school, so this question is very close to my heart. Um, first of all, within uh, the setting of the congregation, um, find ways to incorporate the arts into the worship experience because this is going to have an effect on the congregation. And in fact, I think there's a conference coming up, Yale Divinity School, that's not the school I attended, but uh, in June, on the role of the arts in worship and how they can inspire social, uh, social action. So you might wanna check that out. But, but you can certainly incorporate the arts into the worship experience within the faith community itself. Looking beyond that, um, assuming that a particular uh, religious organization is interested in community service, and most of them are, create arts programs that bring in members of the community. First, simply to experience the art, but that can really lay the foundation for a broader dialogue and a broader conversation within a community setting. Third, if you have a partner institution in another country, find ways to appreciate each other's uh, artistic practices and art forms, because they will probably be be quite different from each other. And finally, I would say that if you're involved at all in any kind of interreligious dialogue or interreligious work, and I hope you are, that the arts can be a tremendous bridge for fostering interreligious understanding because they avoid the theological discussion, they avoid the controversial points that get, people can often get hung up on, but they do create a door simply for appreciating what another religious tradition has done at an artistic level. There's a fabulous exhibit right now, I think it's still there, at the Freer Sackler. Uh, it's an exhibit on the Quran as art. They're not conveying a theological message. They're simply exposing the beauty of the Quran uh, in many different forms as a, as a work of art. So you've got tremendous possibilities there. The root word of the word religion is lig, the middle of that word. And it's the same root as ligament, that which connects our muscles and bones. And religion historians look at the fundamental role of religion is to connect people, to reconnect people, relig, reconnect. And I think it's actually really important for peace builders and religion uh, leaders to think about their primary role is connecting people. And so I kind of agree, forget all this doctrine and all these words and all of our rational arguments about peace. Does our activity bring people together and connect them? I think all of the artists on stage know exactly what their arts are doing. The word media also is in the middle. The, the Latin root, media, is in the middle, which again is actually communicating. It's about connecting people. Um, and so I think if we actually just need to reconceptualize peace building as reconnecting people. Um, I would like to answer the last two questions and just stress on, um, I think, the importance of alliance with decision makers in any level, for peace builders, for people who want to make change, uh, wh uh, whether it's in arts or in any form, it is very important to understand that um, uh, many of you mentioned that, okay, this is uh, great, but it might not necessarily reflect in anything uh, in any change on the ground and I think reaching that level needs uh, correlation and real uh, studying of uh, decision makers uh, power uh, who actually can change this and translate it into a policy and being aware of this is extremely essential and th I think this is the next, next step for uh, uh, peace builders and for anybody who has uh, aspiration to make any change uh, uh, within communities within uh, groups of artists uh, you communicate you exchange these ideas and everything but then there is a one uh, step missing which is uh, taking this on a different level Level, taking it, making it um, an, an, a form of uh, 
pushing for policy change because this can uh, can really make the media and uh, sorry the art flourish at the end of the day and uh, bring more change to uh, to the ground so i just wanted to stress on this and also uh, the religious institutions also is an ally that can be used also for that because religious institutions and and people with public opinion uh, uh, they actually can make the change you need all these uh, figures and institutions on your side in order to translate what your message into reality so hmm. <laughs> so many so many questions out there the, the the one about social media and the appeal of violent extremism I have, I have to remember and I don't think I'm being too stupid about this, have to remember that it's appealing to certain people. It's not appealing to everybody. My 14-year-old son, you know, he might be curious, but it's not really going to interest him. So I think social media is a, it, it's a medium, and it can be used in many, many ways. Our president obviously uses it in a way that's appealed to many, many people who wanted to hear his message. So the question is, and the, the message, if you're looking, if you're a young person and you're looking for a world-saving identity uh, and you're being offered it, it's, it's very, very attractive. Uh, the, even if it, even if it may seem, you know, totally destructive to so many of us, I think we really have to put ourselves back in the mind of being 16, 17, 18 years old, being disaffected, at once disaffected, uh, perhaps oppressed, idealistic, all at once, and that's those are the people to whom the message is appealing. Do we have other messages that are appealing to them? Perhaps, but we really have to look inside and see what we see what we have to offer. One of the things uh, about our work that becomes very clear: we work with these people. We work with lots of lots of young people who would, you know, who are considering becoming uh, suicide bombers, and so they have to discuss. But it's intimate work, and they discover without us preaching to them or telling them this is not good or, you know, you can find a better way. They discover it for themselves. But it's important, uh, and I don't know how to do this on a mass level. I know how to do it, you know, with the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people we reach, but there, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. And if you can give people an opportunity to make discoveries that do come through art, that do come through sharing imagination with being with other people, then they will find their own way. So this is this is my plea for you know creating in this work, using to be sure using the social media, mass media. That's not where I work so much. I'm more focused on what happens if you can bring people together. Almost always they will find more creative and less destructive solutions. There is that sort of a, a amazing life force that's there in, in human beings, even in the very desperate situations. So let me stop there, but the, the, just the ideas that are bouncing around. Um, I'll pick up two other questions. The question about when did arts and culture ever lead to change? I would say they played a hugely important role in what might have been the biggest change in the 20th century, the dissolution, or one of the biggest changes, political changes, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. This doesn't happen in isolation. Same true with ping pong in China. It's not in isolation. It's part of a larger political change. In the case of the end of the Cold War, it was jazz, rock and roll, artists, theater makers, film, in concert with a very serious arms buildup. But all you have to do is just go to YouTube, look at the Bruce Springsteen concert in East Berlin. And all of this is in a fantastic new documentary, uh, free, to, free to Rock, and you can see the impact uh, of rock music. The sad end of the story is, at the, when this happened, 1989, what happened in the 90s? We declared victory and shut off funding for arts and culture from the government. I mean, it wasn't all government, some was private, but we cut off, we cut it off altogether. So bizarre. We won, we succeeded, it worked, so let's never do that again. Uh, you explain it to me. 
um, for the um, question about the ethics in television. I hope that never happens. My question to you would be whose ethics? Um, and I think um, television and media narratives, they're like hip hop, you take the bad with the good, uh, and there's so much good. You know, it's through television narratives that you do get to know other people who maybe you don't know personally, and, and they are humanized. Look at Will and Grace, look at Modern Family, Blackish, Carmichael Show. There's so many examples. One group so far has been more left out, not totally left out, but more left out, and I would say that's Muslims and Muslim Americans. And you're seeing a shift even there, even in this uh, season of Homeland, for example, but this is something I've worked on also. I co-direct something called Most Resource that provides information to writers, producers, showrunners, helping them create more authentic, nuanced Muslim characters and plots. I think that's beginning to shift too, and I think these narratives, these media narratives, are a huge asset and shouldn't be controlled. I think as far as the question about how do we convince the audience, um, I think one of the issues for me is, is that we, we demand to quantify the impact of the arts and hold to this similar standards of other you know, fields. And I think um, we should embrace and perhaps unquantifiable parts of, of the arts. Um, and perhaps we should kind of quantify the same, you know, if we're investing millions of dollars, millions of dollars in southern rates and tanks, and whether or not it's quantified or, or like Actually, they are quantified. When did we last win a war? <laughs> about the artist as an imaginer of what's possible. So, so the dissent is not necessarily the only thing that should be supported or celebrated, but this idea of what, what does radical imagination look like in a community and for a group of people who are not allowed to imagine or dream or think about the idea of being in charge of their government, being in charge of their local community, being accountable and responsible. Um, I think it's super important to be thinking about peace building as a two-way street. I know as an example, um, and part of the reason why we wanted to show the video of the work we do here in DC is because we've learned so much by working with organizations abroad so that we would go there to teach and we would also go there to learn. So that peace building um, isn't just about transforming someplace else. It's also about being transformed by your participation in it and thinking about how what you learn abroad um, for us. What you learn abroad applies to your community. So, so do, is, there, is there a declared war zone in America? No. 
um, not in the way that, we, that we're talking about at this, at this gathering, but are there communities that feel under siege, uh, either by government or by fellow citizens? Yes. And so how is it that we take this, uh, this, this work that is so valuable in transforming other governments, other societies, to think about how it is that we should be transformed by it as well? The question about social media, I think that part of the reason why it's easy to say, because I didn't raise my hand when you asked the question, but I think the reason why it's easy to say that radicals are winning is because it's a really small group of people who are organized versus a very large group of people who are not organized but, but moving in a different direction. So yes, it's easy to point to someone who has a social media team to promote their propaganda or agenda, but the reality is that the overwhelming majority of humanity is not about death and destruction for other people, but about peace and about justice and about equity. Um, and so it's easy for us to ignore it because it's the majority. But if we think about the, the role of the work we do as artists, our arts managers, as funders, as visionaries, that part of our responsibility has to be to think about not just how we transform, but how we are transformed. What, what are the stories that we tell and lift up? What's the role of large institutions and grassroots organizations and independent consultants? How do we, be, how do we act in a way that is actually um, coordinated, <laughs> informed, engaging, versus funded, or sterile, or safe? That if ultimately what we're trying to do is, is work through the arts, to imagine a different kind of world. We have to have spaces for people to take risks that offend some people because offense offers an opportunity to engage as opposed to just being lulled to sleep. Just, just thank you, I really appreciate what you're saying. What, one of, and I was starting to think about the question that I was asking myself is what do you do? What, what does inspire young people? Well, heroic action inspires. I was inspired as a young person by the civil rights movement, by the heroic action of young people, initially black young people and then white young people, you know, standing up. And that, that got to me. And then it was the action, it was the sense of community, and these were conveyed through the media. They were conveyed through the official media, and then they were conveyed just sort of in the kind of underground telegraph. But there was also an element always of celebration, and particularly of music uh, that went along with it. So those three ingredients were uh, enormously important, and they, they need to be, I mean, what's interesting about some of the work that you guys are doing is that it, it does combine those things. You're bringing people together, you're, you're acting in situations that are very difficult, and you're, you're having a good time. I mean, we have to, this is really important. We, we're here to celebrate life. And that's the, that's the opposite of sort of extremist movements that are, in a sense, celebrating death. So we have to you know, go inside and see what we, what we need to do and what situations we need to be in, and then let other people know about it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's give all of our guest speakers, our performers, a round of applause. And uh, if you could stand with us. Yes. Uh, this was an artistic experience and uh, performances, if you will, so let's all take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I will uh, leave you with this um, before I hand it over to Honey for some closing words. Uh, the conversations have just started. Um, we were trying to unpack so many things in what seemed like a long time, four hours, but is actually a very short amount of time. These are all conversations that are happening in the online course. So I encourage everybody to go to usipglobalcampus.org and enroll in this course to continue these conversations, hear more from all these folks who are on the stage, and continue to contribute to these, these discussions. I will also say, um, I think I asked you all, all this question already, we have an online forum on the event webpage. And so all the folks who are watching online have been posting questions there as well. Some got asked, some, some didn't. But if you had a question that didn't get asked because you hadn't formulated it yet or it doesn't come to you until tomorrow, post it in that forum space. We're gonna keep those open for three days and hopefully some or all of our presenters and performers will be able to pop in there and respond to your questions in that online space. 
Thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for being here today, for everybody that has been here for the past five hours and everybody online, of course. Um, this sharing of knowledge is, is so very important. As Darren said, the, co the conversation will continue. It will continue not only online, but we're going to go ahead and go to Geneva on the 21st of June. So if you are there, join us for a second series for the launch at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And then in September, uh, we will be in New York. So anybody who's there, please join us as well. We hope you enjoy the course and that you find it useful. I want to say thank you to the USIP Global Campus. Thank you very much, Dominic, Darren, um, uh, Ambassador Doucet, thank you, uh, to GCSP, to everybody, over 20 people. I wish I can name everybody that has worked on this course, but it did take a lot of effort, a lot of research, a lot of work. It's two years in the making and so happy to be here to be launching it with all of you. Thank you very much.